Welcome everybody to PacBio's Long Read RNA Neurology Symposium. Thanks for logging in, we're happy to have you. My name is Nina Gonzaludo. I'm in the Human Genomics Segment Marketing Team here at PacBio. And today I'll be joined by Liz Tseng, who is um, Associate uh, Director of Product Marketing at PacBio as well. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping notes. Um, for this symposium, all presentations have been pre-recorded. We're going to follow each talk with a live Q&A, about five minutes each for each speaker, and it will follow directly after their pre-recorded presentation. If you have any questions for any of the speakers, please feel free to submit them in the questions module on your att attendee control panel. Um, and if there are any questions left that we are not able to address, we will hold them until the open discussion at the end of the symposium. And those times are shown here. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you are interested in learning more, we have related PacBio literature available in the handouts module, again, in your attendee control panel and the on-demand recordings for this symposium will be available at a later date. So very briefly walking through the agenda for today. Um, today's symposium will be in three parts. We'll start off with session one, which will be around RNA research and developmental brain biology. We'll start with an overview talk by Liz, um, followed by um, speakers Andy Yang, Jack Humphrey, and Mike Gandal. Um, I'll note that Jack Humphrey, unfortunately, um, cannot join us today. He is ill, so he will not be available for the live Q&A. So after Jack's talk, we'll go directly into Mike's talk. Um, the, um, after that, we'll have a short break with uh, Ki Pin, who is a senior scientist at PacBio and is going to talk about visualization. Um, he will also not have a live Q&A, but we'll take questions in the chat. Session two will be more of a translational focus um, for neurodegenerative disease. Um, we'll have talks by Anise and Emil. Um, and then finally, we'll end the symposium with an open discussion. And for this, all speakers who are able to join us will be live. Um, we really want this to be an interactive session, so please come with your questions. Um, if you put them in the chat, we will try to address them. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll check in periodically in terms of timing, but again, please ask questions and um, enjoy the talks. Liz? Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz, and I'm an Associate Director of Product Marketing at PacBio. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about high-throughput four-length isoform sequencing for bulk and single-cell transcriptome. I'm gonna divide my talk into four parts. First, I'm going to show you some publications and explain why the isoseq method is important because isoforms and not genes are the drivers of biology and disease. Then I will talk about our current on-market MOSSEQ for 10x single cell through PROM kit. I will briefly touch upon technical advantages and different considerations when using the PacBio ISOSeq method. And finally, a preview of the MOSSEQ for bulk ISOSeq kit and informatics. So let's get started. Alternative splicing is the process in which exons from the same gene are joined in different combinations, leading to different but related transcript isoforms. These isoforms can then be translated to produce different proteins with distinct structures and functions. In humans, up to 95% of the genes are thought to undergo alternative splicing. Aberrant splicing has been shown to lead to diseases. A classic example in cancer is the BCLX gene where two different isoforms have the opposing effect. One promotes apoptosis and has a protected uh, function on cancer, while the other is anti-apoptotic and is overexpressed in cancer cells. With short-read RNA-seq, cDNA are fragmented then assembled computationally. 
This is a problem since alternative splicing produces many isoforms that look similar, making it impossible to unambiguously infer the original set of transcript isoforms. In contrast, the PacBio isoseq method sequences falling cDNA up to 10 kilobases with no assembly required. This gives you a complete view of the isoform landscape. In the following sections, I want to show you one publication where isoseq helped discover novel isoforms associated with disease and phenotypes. GWAS has revealed many loci associated with splicing, while short read RNA seq has helped identify splicing QTLs that co localize with GWAS loci. But these alone cannot provide isoform level information. In this study, the researchers used bulk isoseq to characterize isoform expression changes associated with bone mineralization in a fe human fetal osteoblast system. They combined GWAS, SQTL, mass spectrometry, and bulk isoseq to infer the effects of splicing QTL on the protein isoforms. They generated isoseq data for human fetal osteoblasts at four different time points and analyzed it using the following informatics pipeline. They start with the isoseq informatics in SmartLink, followed by SCON-T3 for isoform classification and TAPAS for differential expression analysis. So what did they discover? Here are some vignettes. The ZNF800 uh, zinc finger protein 800 gene is a transcription factor. SQTL identified a novel junction that was not found in gen code, but they weren't able to resolve the isoform using just short reads. Using isoseq data, they were able to characterize the novel isoform shown here in red. Further, this novel isoform expression was shown to decrease during differentiation. Here's an example of using isoseq to discover novel isoforms. In the second example, the opposite actually happened. The OS9 gene has 24 annotated isoforms in gen code. Isoseq data shows actually only four of them expressed in the human fetal osteoblast. The isoforms are in two different um, kind of signatures. One, uh, two of them skips the exon 13, and two of them includes the exon 13. The two isoforms that include in exon 13 OS9202 and 204 increases during differentiation, whereas the other two isoforms that exclude exon 13 decreases. This suggests a direct role of the isoforms in driving osteoblast differentiation. In this final example, the researchers looked at the TPM2 gene, which codes for beta tropomyosin, which regulates contractile machinery of muscle cells and is not previously linked to bone mineral density, but was a GWAS candidate. The isoseq data find four primary isoforms with mutual exclusivity of exon 6 and 7, as well as alternative last exons, exon 10 and 11. Targeted mass spectrometry confirmed protein isoform expression. When looking at the GWAS data, they found that the two alleles, T and C, had opposing effects on bone mineral density and the isoform expressing exon 6 and 7. They hypothesized that exon 6 containing TPM2 isoforms would be negatively associated with mineralization, whereas isoforms containing exon 7 would have the opposing effect. This was confirmed by a siRNA experiment where they knocked down exon 6 and 7. And indeed, with exon 6 and 7 knockdowns, mineralization had opposing effects. They conclude that different TPM2 isoforms have distinct functions with respect to osteoblast activity and are likely regulators of BMD. The publication shows that to fully understand disease, Simply adding SQTL data is insufficient. Full-length isoform information adds functional interpretation, which ultimately can lead to identifying the protein isoform drivers of disease. Next, I will talk about our on-market MOSSEQ for 10X single cell 3 prom kit. First, let's talk about the advantages of using long reads over short reads for single cell. 
In short reads, because of the single cell tag information being only at one end of the molecule, typically the three prime end, short reads can only get partial gene information, typically 50 to 100 bases. In contrast, long reads can capture the entire full length isoform with the single cell tag information. This is enables us to identify cell type isoform spec specificity. I will show you two examples of applying single cell isoseq. The first, the researchers found with isoseq in aging down syndrome brains that different genes, here shown four of them, have different isoform proportions in different cell types. The different colors are different isoforms and the different bars are different cell types. They showed that microglia had the highest proportion of novel isoforms. They also found differential isoform expression, uh, uh, differential isoform usage in these genes related to disease. In a second example, the researchers applied both bulk and single cell isoseq to a, a pediatric patient with epilepsy. Using exon sequencing, they first determined that the P10 gene had two variants on exon 5 and 9. Targeted bulk isoseq confirmed that the two variants were in fact in trans. Further, when targeted single cell isoseq was applied, they found that the exon 5 and 9 variants were in fact cell type specific. Up until recently, single cell isoseq studies have been limited with its application due to throughput on a single smart cell. With the MOSSEQ method, however, a single cell can now be used to fully characterize single cell libraries with a single smart cell. MOSSEQ is a general amplicon concatenation method where short cDNA amplicons, such as those produced by the 10x chromium systems, can be concatenated to create larger fragments to be sequenced with PacBio HiFi sequencing. Because of HiFi's accuracy, this concatenation increases the effective molecular yield without affecting the ability to call barcodes in UMIs. The MOSSEQ authors demonstrated the ability to attain 33 million cDNA molecules on a single smart cell on the SQL2 system in a 6,000 cell CDA plus T cell library. Not only was the long read data able to recapitulate the short read based cell types, it also revealed isoform information that was not able to be seen with short reads. Here's an example of the CD45 isoforms, such as RBRAB, displaying cell type specificity. PacBio has commercialized the MOSSEQ method for 10x single cell 3 prom cDNA. It takes 15 to 75 nanograms of cDNA with a targeted cell recovery from the chromium system of 3,000 to 10,000 cells. From 10x cDNA to sequencing ready, ready library is two days of preparation. It is compatible with both SQL 2 2E and Revio systems. And the SmartLink workflow would produce gene and isoform count matrix that are compatible with tertiary analysis tools. Now I want to talk briefly about technical advantages and considerations. If we think about what the goals for RNA sequencing are, we can see why read length and accuracy are both important. If the goal was to identify full length isoform structures, quantify the isoforms, or discover allele-specific isoform expressions, long read lengths are required to capture the full isoform, whereas accuracy is required to call the variants for allele specificity. For splice junction detection, variant detection, and single cell UMI barcode identification, which are much smaller signatures, high accuracy is required. This is why, compared to other sequencing technologies, PacBio through HiFi sequencing, having both long read lengths and accuracy, is capable of doing single cell RNA sequencing without the need for error correction or orthogonal sequencing methods. I want to show you the result of a recent consortium study. The LRGAS consortium published a preprint comparing different cDNA preparation and sequencing platforms. They found that PacBio detected the greatest number of genes and exclusively detected transcripts that were the longest and had significantly lower expression. Interestingly, they noted that ONT data, despite having comparatively more reads, did not consistently lead to more transcripts, indicating that read quality and length 
are important factors for transcript identification. And while both long read technologies had good reproducibility and consistency across replicates, the researchers found that ISOSeq had twofold higher abundance resolution, the ability to quantify isoforms, compared to ONT cDNA data. Further, the consortium validated novel isoforms discovered with PacBio and ONT with targeted PCR and obtained a 100% validation rate for novel isoforms that were consistently detected across pipelines. What's more surprising is even for the isoforms that were not consistently reproduced across cipher pipelines, they still had a high validation rate. The consortium concluded that some of these novel isoforms do indeed are expressed and are not library artifacts. A final brief consideration when we think about rare isoform discovery is the approaches that we can take. First is we can always sequence more increase the molecular yield through such as MASIC method. The advantage is there are no gene knowledge required and you maintain the transcript abundances. Of course, you do have to do extra library preparation. The two other approaches are to enrich, such as using probe-based enrichment. It requires the least amount of sequencing, but requires an a priori knowledge of the genes of interest. The opposite would be to deplete the genes that are known to be of no interest, such as using CRISPR-based depletion, such as the jump code kits. The drawback is that the non-informative genes may be sample and tissue specific. In this final section, I wanna give you a preview of the MOSSEQ for bulk isoseq. We've recently released a preview of the data set of applying MOSSEQ on bulk for Revio on the HC02 uh, cell line. We obtained 38 million reads after deconcatenation, resulting in 22,000 unique genes and over 500,000 isoforms. As you can see, the read lengths go up to 10 kilobases. The saturation curves for known and all isoforms show that um, at around 10 milli million reads, we've saturated most of the known gene, uh, sorry, known isoforms, not genes. This kit, which is coming by the end of the year, will start with total RNA and will allow multiplexing both at the cDNA level and at the adapter level. The input will be total RNA, 300 nanograms, RIN over seven. From RNA to sequencing ready, two days, multiplexing support and compatible with all of our long read systems. The informatics will include read deconcatenation, and all the typical ISOSeq processing, identifying full length reads, clustering at the isoform level, mapping, and the newest addition is isoform classification using SCONTI, which will produce the associated genes and transcripts, including novel ones, as well as the sample read count. We're excited to show you this expansion of the MOSSEQ technology to bulk ISOSeq, and also, while not a topic of this uh, symposium, the 16S ribosomal RNA. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I see one in the chat um, asking about what is the depth of isoseq? Um, are all isoforms captured and especially those with very low expression? Yeah, and I think the very um, end of my talk actually talks about it. So with mass bulk, which is coming at the end of the year, on Revia, we're getting 30 to 40 million full length reads. So these are, they don't require assembly. They're much longer. They're, you know, a thousand to 10,000 10, kilobases. When we did the rare refraction analysis, which was shown in this, at the end of the slide, we actually were able to saturate the known isoforms at about 10 million reads. We've basically said, you know, we've seen all everything that we could see with gen code, even with novel isoforms of which I firmly believe you can't saturate the, the you know, all of the isoforms that are ever expressed, there's just a lot of intermediate mRNAs and uh, rare isoforms. But even at, you know, 20 to 30 million reads, we're saturating most of the 
uh, novel isoforms as well. Okay, yeah, so I see, um, Nina, do you want to repeat the question? I think there's more questions and I'll, I'll let you repeat them. Sure, um, so the next question we have um, was, I think, um, what you just mentioned were the 38 million reads long reads and what was the average length? Yeah, so I'll repeat it again. The sort of these 38 million reads, the I know that slide came kind of fast, um, but the average read length was one to two kilobases, which is the same as if you look at about analyze a trace from RNA, and it goes up to 10 kilobases. Uh, I will put the link to the data set um, in the chat since this data is already public if people are interested. Thank you. Um... I think this one's talking about longer isoforms. Can isoseq apply to isoforms with 20 kb? So I think 20 kb will be very difficult. Um, actually, not so much even without with or without concatenation because it's very hard to synthesize a 20 kilobase cDNA. The longest I think I've seen in all of my isoseq days is 15 kilobases. I think 20 will be difficult. What most likely will happen, by the way, if you look at how CD and the synthesis is done, is we will capture the three promen of the molecule. So, you know, like if you think about genes like Huntington's or Titan, we do actually get parts of the gene because we start um RNA to cDNA synthesis with DT priming. So we'll capture either the poly A tail or interestingly sometimes the poly A tracks that's part of the transcripts. And then we re do a reverse transcription. And that RT step is usually not very processive. So the longest I've seen is 15. I think with a 20 kb I a gene, most likely what you will see is that you'll get with some luck, 10 to 15 kilobases on the three prom end, but you won't be able to get the true five prom end. Okay, this question's asking about um, analysis tools. What are the reason that makes Sconti the best for isoform detection yeah. and annotation compared to other tools? Right, so there's of course other long read tools. We're just, I think I'll answer it two ways. First is most of the short read tools don't really work for long reads because they don't understand that the isoforms are already full length and we honor the five prom and three prom ends. Um, Sconti was developed specifically for long read data, um, even more so for PacBio data since its early days. It created a set of nomenclature. Um, you might see them in some other long read papers that talk about something like FSM, ISM, false splice matches. Actually, most of the talks after my talk today will use Sconti as a common nomenclature to say, you know, what are isoforms that are known? So that's FSM. ISM is something that is missing a few exons compared to gen code and novel isoforms like NIC, NNC. So I wouldn't say that's the best long read uh, t tool, but it's one that's been tried and true and has been really designed to work with uh, long read data. And further, the same uh, lab that generated Sconti also produces other uh, software downstream called Tapas and ISO or not that are used for functional annotation of uh, long read data as well as differential expression. There are other long read uh, tools out there like Flare and um, I think Mandalorian was also designed for long read ONT data. So I'm not saying it's the only long read tool that's out there. Great, thank you. Um, we still have several questions coming in, but for the interest of keeping the time, I think we're going to move these again to the open discussion um, in session three later today. So if you need to jump off, please make sure you jump on um, for that. So we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, next, we have Andy Yang from the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Thanks, All right, so hello, my name is Andy Yang. I'm a master's student at the ICON School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And the title of today's talk is Moving Towards a Resolved Atlas of Cell Type Specific Isoforms in the Human Cortex. 
So alternative splicing is an important post-transcriptional regulatory mechanism that increases both the transcriptomic and proteomic diversity in humans. So here in this diagram, on the left is a pre-mRNA, and as it is alternative splice, it can then form two splice variants, or isoforms. And then these isoforms can then translate into two different proteins with various functions. So traditionally, Methods used to study alternative splicing relied heavily on short reads. And so these are reads that span anywhere from 50 to 200 base pairs. But there are some issues with this. So on one hand, few reads span splice junctions. And on the other hand, this, they can also cause sequence gaps. So this causes incomplete coverage. But with the advent of long read sequencing, so now we're generating reads that uh, exceed 500 base pairs, we can now get reads that fully span um, end to end and provide full link coverage. And so two previous studies that are relevant to my study have utilized long read sequencing in order to study isoforms in the brain. But there are two main limitations that I wanna point out that will be motivations for my study. So for the first paper, they utilize bulk RNA-seq samples. But the issue here is that bulk RNA-seq doesn't fully appreciate the isoforms that are expressed at the single cell level. And for the second paper, this was all done in mouse models, but I'm interested mainly in human brains. And so our main knowledge gap is that our understanding of alternative splicing events, which includes their expression and usage, at the individual cell level in the human brain still remains poorly understood. So using long read sequencing technology from PacBio, my main objective was to systematically discover and characterize cell type specific isoforms across the human cortex. And so we obtained healthy brain samples from an approach known as fluorescence associated nuclei sorting or FANS. And so here I have a figure of how it works. So given a postmortem tissue, we can use certain fluorescence, immunofluorescent antibodies like NUN or RPFOX3 in order to extract neuronal cells from non-neuronal cells in this tissue. And then we can use further markers like SOX6 to separate GABA from GLU in the neuron populations. And then we can use SOX10 to separate oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and microglia, and IR5 to separate microglia from the astrocytes. And so here's just a fan scatter plot of the separation process. And so the main benefit of using fans is that we can sequence larger pools of nuclei Per donor, and by doing so, we can then get better coverage. And this is this is this as opposed to other tools like um, sing or other methods like single nuclei RNA seq, which only provides sparse coverage. So here's an overview of our transcriptome data using that FANS method that I just talked about. So in the blue rows, those are all of our samples coming from, that are the long read samples from PacBio. And you'll see that we're getting samples from GABA, GLU, and OLIC from both the DLPFC and OFC. Um, but the OFC also contains samples from the AST and microglia. And then to add an, an additional layer to our long reads, we're also including Illumina short reads, so these green rows. And we're doing this in order to provide quantitative, in order to quantify our isoforms, but also to get their abundances. And so here's an overview of our workflow. So on the left is a more detailed look at what I did, and I, broken it up into three parts. So in the first part, we process the transcriptome of data, which includes the long reads, but also the short reads. And then once we do this, we can then detect and characterize the isoforms, and then follow that up with some validations. And then for our downstream analyses, I'm still at the early stages of my project, but so far I've ran a differential isoform expression and I've also looked at, the, looked at the minimum free energy of the predicted RNA secondary structures for all of the isoforms detected in my study. So for the remaining slides, I'll be showing you the results that were gathered for steps two and three. So to characterize our isoforms, I utilize a tool known as Squatty, 
And so what Squatty essentially does is that it compares your isoforms against a reference transcriptome in relation to their splice junctions. And by doing so, we can then get these structural categories. And so here are four of them. I have full splice matches, incomplete splice match, novel catalog, and novel not in catalog. In addition to these four isoforms categories, there are other novel transcript categories, and these include the genic genomic, antisense, fusion, and the intergenic. So the structural categories for my isoforms are these. So in the DLPFC, I detected over 70,000 isoforms, and then in the OFC, I detected over 140,000 isoforms. And you can see within each cell type and within both brain regions, that about half of the reads are full splice matches and incomplete splice matches. So these are the known categories. And, but in addition to this, there's a large fraction of isoforms that are also novel. So those that belong to the NIC, NNC, and other categories. Now to further characterize our isoforms, I looked at their medium transcript length and their exon counts. And so the medium transcript length for the DOPFC was around 3,700, and then around 2,500 for the OFC. And then the exon counts for the DLPFC was 11, and then 8 for the OFC. Now next, we wanted to validate our reads to make sure that they're actually full length, or they span completely from the 5' prime end all the way to the 3' prime end. And so for the 5' prime end, I, I utilize cage peaks, which provides confidence at the transcription start site end, as well as poly A motifs and poly A sites, which provides confidence at the 3' prime end. So these are my results. So the lighter shade are all of the reads that were detected in the OFC, and the darker shade are those that were detected in the DLPFC. And you can see that on the 5' prime end, about 70% of the transcripts that belong to the FSM, ISM, NIC, and NNC categories have support. And then on the 5' prime end, over 70% of those transcripts have poly A support. And these values, these support values are pretty consistent with those that were found in other studies that utilize long read sequencing. And so here are some examples that I've provided. Um, so here we're looking at the gene RAP1 gap, and I'm showing you some of the isoforms that were enriched in all cell types. And you can see that they are indeed full splice. So they go to they go all the way from the five prime end to the three prime end. And then I have another gene, NDRG2, which you can see that most of the isoforms are mainly enriched in the non-neuronal cell types than they are in the neuronal cell types. And another gene, P2RX4, which is, once again, mostly enriched in the non-neuronal cell types, but you can see that there's a clear bias in the microglia. So without even doing any downstream analyses yet, you can already start to see that there is some level of cell type specificity at the isoform level. So next, I wanted to see the coding potential of these isoforms. But before doing that, I looked at the number of isoforms that are associated with each gene. You can see that majority of the genes in both brain regions contain only one, two, or three isoforms. And there are a few hundred of genes that do contain more than 10 isoforms. And interestingly, we also discovered that there were isoforms that mapped to novel genes, and it's a really small fraction. And most of these novel genes only have one isoform. Now going to the coding potential or probability, we can see that in both brain regions, majority of these reads exhibit very high coding probability. And when you break this down into their structural categories, we can see that the novel in catalog and novel non in catalog isoforms do have a very high coding probability. And these scores are pretty on par with the known transcripts, which are the FSM and ISM categories. Now, for our downstream analysis, we first did a differential isoform expression analysis. But before doing that, one interesting thing that we found was that a lot of our reads tend to be donor specific or sample specific. So we can see that the number of isoforms that are unique 
in each biological replicate is very large in comparison to the number of isoforms that are shared between two donors or samples and the number of isoforms that are shared in three. And so this suggests that isoform discovery is heavily reliant on the number of samples, donors, and replicants that you have. And so for our differential isoform expression, I looked at the number of isoforms that were shared across both brain regions. And this number is 1,309 isoforms. And I was interested in seeing if there's a cell type preference in the expression of these isoforms. And we can see that a majority of them are neuronal, um, but we do have some that do have a non-neuronal preference and some that are shared. And so for our last analysis, I looked at the minimum free energy of the predicted RNA structures for all of the detected isoforms in my data set. And so MFE is just a way of, of measuring how thermodynamically stable a RNA structure is. So the lower the number is, the more stable the RNA structure would be. And so from these results, we can see that generally the novel in catalog and novel not in catalog transcripts do exhibit lower MFE values. And this would suggest that they're exhibiting more stable structures than known structures. So in conclusion, through our ISOSeq data, we found that neuronal and non-neuronal cell populations in the DLPFC and OFC regions exhibit extensive and distinctive transcript diversity. And within these cell populations, non-neuronal cell types tend to exhibit higher isoform discovery. In addition, we found a lot of novel isoforms and majority of them do contain a very high protein coding potential. But we also found that isoform discovery is largely, largely driven by the number of donors that you have. And lastly, novel isoforms exhibit reduced MFE values than those of known isoforms, and once again, suggesting that they're exhibiting more stable structures. And lastly, I wanna thank Kirk and previous members of the Brain Lab. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Andy. Um, it looks like we have a few questions for you in the chat. Um, so let's start off maybe speaking about the experiment. Do you perform short and long reads on the same sample? And if not, how do you integrate the data? So we, so they're not, uh, so the short reads and long reads, they're not on the same sample per se. I think if you go back to my table, then you'll kind of see more detailed views of what that is. But I, I think the second part of the question is why we utilize the short reads with the long reads. Is that correct? Or can you repeat that again? Sure, it's just, do you perform and if, if so, or if not, how do you integrate short and long read data? But if you want to go into it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's more so for our downstream analyses. Um, so for instance, when I'm running a differential isoform expression, uh, typically with short reads, you would map these to a reference genome and then you can quantify uh, the reads. Uh, but with long reads, uh, it's a bit more complicated, but essentially, since we're generating much longer reads, we can actually use our long reads as the reference. Um, and then we can uh, map the short reads to the long read and then quantify it in there for, yeah. Okay, great. Um, one comment, great talk, Andy. Was there a threshold number of reads that you used to validate whether the transcript, transcript was real versus an artifact? And then I think there's a similar question how likely do you think it is that many novel isoforms are actually functional versus rare misplacing right, mistakes? Right. Yeah, so those are great questions. Uh, so in terms of the threshold, it actually kind of depends on the tool that you use. So I use Squanty3. Um, I know Liz mentioned other tools like uh, Stringtie, Talon, Bamboo, Mandalorian, and the list goes on and on. Um, but typically, 
once again, we're using short reads. So if short reads, if a certain number of short reads are mapping to the long reads, then that kind of provides support. Um, but if you don't have short reads, you can also utilize another threshold where if you have, you know, let's just say more than 10 long reads, then that can provide a bit more confidence that our long read is actually legit. Uh, but you should definitely do more downstream um, validations to actually see if these are um, legit. Um, and then there's another question about the functions. Could you repeat that part? Sure. Um, how likely do you think it is that many novel isoforms are actually functional versus rare misplacing mistakes? And how do you determine which they are? Right, right. More I think, yeah. validation. Right. I, I think first you should see if these isoforms are subjected to some kind of mRNA uh, degradation like NMD. Um, I did not include this in my presentation, but a lot of our novel isoforms were actually subjected to NMD, meaning that these mRNAs won't actually be translated into a protein, and so thereby there won't be any functions. Um, but in terms of assessing the, the functions, you could utilize like proteomics. Um, I mean, there's a lot that you can do downstream. It kind of just depends on what you're really interested in. So yeah. Um, great, and then maybe we'll end with um, two sort of similar questions. Um, let's see, what is the average counts of these subject specific transcripts? And do you have a sense of the sample number at which the number of identified transcripts plateaus? Um, is um, it variable across cell right, types? Right. I, I don't actually have that number, but I'm in the process of gathering those things. And so. Okay. All right. Um, somebody asked, can you elaborate on how you evaluated NMD or how you're doing it? Um, so NMD, so SQUAT-T3 actually incorporates uh, I don't actually know exactly how they incorporate it, but they do have this algorithm where they can actually predict whether an isoform is subjected to NMD. And it's, uh, I guess the threshold, I guess you could say threshold or the way they can identify it is if there's a, a stop codon that's 50 base pairs um, ahead of the stop. Uh, so there's a stop codon that happens before the three prime end or the transcription term. Oh, I can't I can't answer this or, since I'm, yeah, I'm, the, person who wrote, I'm the person who wrote it. Yes. Um, so in Sconti we uh Sconti three we first do open radio frame translation and we'll know where the stop codon is. If that stop codon is is um, more than 50 bases upstream of the last exon exon junction um, I believe it's the last not necessary and well, yeah, because if it's before the last, it'll be before anything else. So then, um, then it will mark it as an NMD as uh, in one of the columns in Sconti. Yep. Perfect. Um, thank you, Andy, for joining us. Um, we should be moving on um, to keep to time, and Andy, we'll see you later. Um, so you. next we have um, Jack Murphy, and um, again, Jack is unable to join us for the live Q&A at this time. So after Jack's talk, we'll go straight into Michael Gandel's talk. Thanks. Hi there, I'm Jack Humphrey. I'm a junior faculty member at Mount Sinai, and I work with Tofik Raj in the neuroscience and genetics departments. And today I'm going to talk about our long read work in human microglia, uh, really looking at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And so there's been tremendous progress in the past few years on genome-wide association studies in, in both diseases. And we now have a number of loci associated with disease risk. And so if you haven't seen one of these plots before, these are called Manhattan plots because they have these big towers of association. So each dot here is a genetic variant. And then the p-value here on the y-axis is, is the association between the risk of getting the disease and the change in the allele frequencies at, at each variant. So you can see um, we've got lots of loci to work with now in, in both diseases, um, but it's important to note that these are simply maps of risk throughout the genome. Uh, having a GYS does not tell you exactly what the risk gene is, although people like to name the nearest gene to the, to the lead association. It doesn't tell you about the cell types involved. It doesn't tell you about the pathways. And so additional work downstream of a GYS really needs to be done 
uh, to understand what they mean. So this is what our lab specializes in, and it's a set of techniques and tools called functional genomics. And so we use the GUIs as the, as the starting point, and we dig into each locus. So here we've zoomed in on a particular association. You can see there are some SNPs, these variants that are associated. And so we look at what are the causal variants of all of these, which ones are actually doing the, the job molecularly. Uh, what are the cell types involved? So we use additional data sets here to look at regulatory sequences, things like that. And ultimately, what are the genes? Because just because a gene is the nearest to the lead association does not make it or always the causal gene. We actually need to look at all the genes across and generate additional data sets uh, to understand this. And so we've had huge success in generating quantitative trait loci. And so these are maps of associations where you take uh, hundreds or thousands of individuals where you have paired genotype data, so genetic variants, and a molecular phenotype, so in this case, gene expression. But uh, for, for the, for we're going to talk about uh, splicing later, but really, you can do this with anything. And so we generate these maps of associations, and so they look very similar here, where you have the association, in this case, with the genetic variant and gene expression, and we can overlay that with the GWAS and say something about the underlying molecular mechanism here uh, using what's called co-localization. So uh, my uh, mentor, Tofik Raj, did this quite a while now in, in cells from the blood. And so he took uh, T cells and monocytes from the blood and associated them with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's risk. And what he found is this polarization towards monocytes as opposed to T cells. And this was really striking. As you can see, it's very different from some of the other diseases um, because uh, monocytes in the blood are part of the myeloid cell lineage of the innate immune system. And so in the central nervous system, these cells are known as microglia. So they're, they're, they're sort of cousins of, of monocytes. Um, but at the time, back in 2014, there wasn't a good reference of microglia QTLs. And so we generated the microglia genomic atlas. This is a collaboration with the DeWitt group in the Netherlands, where we took 100 donors and we dissected brain regions and we extracted microglia. So you can use magnetic beads here. Uh, to get the microglia out where we can then do RNA sequencing and genotyping. And so this was published last year. Um, and we looked at expression, but we also managed to look at splicing. And so this was using the, the classic leaf cutter approach where you take intron spanning splice junction reads. So this is a gene called CD33. There's an Alzheimer's GWAS that says it's this SNP is the lead SNP here. And we found a splicing QTL in these introns here that either include exon2 or skip exon2. And so this has been shown before in, in blood and other peripheral tissues, but we could see it in microglia. And I think what's really exciting about the CD33 example is that skipping out exon2 here changes the protein domains, right? You get rid of this IGV sialic acid binding domain when you, when you skip it out. And so I think splicing in general is a really interesting way of thinking about disease because it's not just a gene turning up or down, it's actually changing what the eventual coding protein will do. Um, so this was exciting, and we could we could get some results out of our intron data from our short read, but we really wanted to push forward and use the, the newer long read technology, which we're all here to learn more about. And so uh, the way I think about long read is that uh, we, we have our genome, we have our annotations, right, our known exons in the, gene, in the genome, and we have short read data that finds novel things, right? We can see sometimes there are short reads that sit within an intron. We have junctions that split across. And we can kind of assemble this and we can say something about novelty and isoforms, but it really is a very challenging problem. Now, with long read RNA-seq, the read gives you the isoform um, in, in, the best, in the best case, right? And so we can then use those isoforms to say something about novel exons, novel promoters, novel intron retention, three prime UTRs. And it also, for free, gives us the predicted coding sequence. And so we can think about examples like CD33, where splicing changes will change the, uh, the, the, the eventual proteoform. And so this has led us to our, our new project, which I'm presenting today, the isoform-centric microglia genomic atlas, or isomega. And so this has involved the generating of 30 PacBio CCS libraries. This is on a SQL2 machine. We got about 90 million long reads here. We have our existing short read data, uh, which we've then meta-analyzed across multiple cohorts. Now, so we're up to 555 samples, 391 genotypes. So we have that paired genotype phenotype data, but because we have the long reads, we can create a reference. We can create a microglia isoform reference where we find novel isoforms here from the microglia. This is done uh, in hybrid assembly with, with string tie, which we can then add to GenCode here. So the standard set of annotated isoform to create this augmented isoform reference. And we do this principally because we don't think 
that the that the long read as it as it stands is capturing every isoform. So we don't want to just use the microglia isoform reference. We want to incorporate gen code as well because there's other genes that we're potentially not picking up here but are expressed. And so we've done functional validation, which I won't address today, but we did quite a, a few different things, including mass spec to find uh, protea, uh, protea, um, iso, uh, peptides, I'm sorry, that, um, that support these isoforms. Uh, but we do genetics, and that's really what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk, uh, is the genetic association that we did. And so uh, the reference contains novel isoforms. You can see this is the isomega, so just the isoforms we could find in the, in the long, short hybrid reference compared to GenCode. You can see we're finding uh, around 20, 20, 30,000 genes, 150 or so thousand isoforms, of which about 35,000 are novel. And you can see if you split up these references, the three references we have by splicing events using supper, you can see that in the GenCode references, it's really alternative first exons, so alternative promoters are the most common event encoded by these different isoforms, whereas you can see that we're actually picking up a lot of intron retention. So our novel isoforms are uh, including a lot of intron retention events. And we can see that using the squanty classification of these novel isoforms, most of them are novel in catalog. So this includes mostly intron retention events, of which about 57% are predicted to be protein coding. So taking those amino acid sequences. You can see that we're finding some novel genes as well. So these gene fusions, where two genes are actually uh, transcribed together. There's some intergenic and genic things down here. These are largely non-coding, but you can see these fusions, some of them are actually protein coding. I'll show you some nice examples in a second. And so CD33, uh, the gene I mentioned before, we were actually really surprised to see that there are fusions, including CD33. You can see that the upstream gene here, SIGLEC22P, this is a pseudo gene uh, from the same gene family as CD33, these, these exons are actually spliced into CD33 where they form a novel 5' UTR here, an untranslated region. So potentially regulatory effects on the gene. You can see it's the fourth most expressed when we look at short read estimations using salmon, uh, taking our short reads. And you see there's a, a, a variety of these fusions down here that are expressed at different levels with different, um, uh, different consequences in terms of protein coding. So this was really exciting. We've actually found several other examples of fusion genes uh, including some other interesting genes for disease. So what about the genetics? So the classic way of thinking about uh, gene expression is you just estimate your gene expression and then you stratify by genotype. And so you can see that in this case, the two copies of the A at this variant will increase gene expression. And so when we think about splicing, we can do a very similar approach. Uh, this is leaf cutter, the standard in the field, where you take the junction spanning reads, you cluster them together, the ones that overlap, and you take the count of each junction against the total. Um, and this is annotation agnostic because it's just splice junctions that are aligned to the genome. Um, but what we can do, because we have these novel isoforms uh, from isomega, is we can look at isoform usage. So now we quantify each isoform and take the ratio of that isoform against the total for that gene. And then to get at the individual splicing event types that are, that are contained within these isoforms. So in this case, this is an isoform with a, a novel cassette exon inclusion here. Uh, we can break this down. And so then we can say we want to take any isoform that contains this particular cassette and compare it to the total. So we can do this for exon skipping, intron retention, splice sites, and alternative first or last exons. So this gives us a lot of QTLs to work with, which we can then co-localize with both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease to find new and interesting uh, associations. So what does this look like? So the, the two GWASs that we were working with from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, you can see Almost half of the Alzheimer's loci have at least one uh, gene expression QTL here. So um, a lot of these have been seen before. This, uh, the color of these bars is the, is, the, is the probability from zero to one, with one being the highest of the same genetic variants being shared by both the GWAS and by the, the molecular phenotype. And then you can see we have lots of splicing QTLs. So this is just using GenCo, the orange, and taking uh, none of the novelized forms. You can see it's actually very similar between the two. So we're not finding a huge number of loci that only contain novel isoforms. Uh, we're actually seeing a change in our interpretation. You see the numbers change a little bit. You can see intron retention, for example, goes from three to eight here in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we think we're actually just changing our interpretation. So having additional information from the long read data is helping us understand these isoforms a bit better and, and the, the genetic loci. And so let's go back to CD33 again. What we can see here, so I'm plotting each uh, QTL type 
and then the dots are the co-localization probability, so higher is better. And what we can see is that we find junction usage, transcript usage, and exon skipping all basically the same probability between the two references. And then with intron retention, we're picking up an association only with those novel isoforms included, whereas we're seeing splice site changes only in the gen code. So they're kind of mutually exclusive of each other here. And if we dig down into what's going on, what we can see is that we're finding the transcript QTLs that um, suggest the second exon here. We're finding the junction QTLs from LeafCutter, again, suggesting the second exon, what we saw before. Then we have an exon skipping QTL from Supper, and now we have an intron retention effect here. So what we're seeing is there's both an effect on the inclusion of exon two, but also the retention of intron one. And so I should point out this has been reported before um, by, uh, by this group back in 2015. Um, what we showed um, using the long read is that we kind of extended this a bit to show there is a relationship between these two events as exon two goes down, intron one goes up. And so the A allele here is protective against Alzheimer's disease, in fact. So your risk of Alzheimer's goes down if you're producing less of this exon two and more of that intron retention. And so what our long read allows us to do is we can go back to those isoforms and say, well, which ones include intron one, this retention event? And we can see there are two here that are both non-coding, but two here down here that are coding. And so what we can then predict using our map of the proteoform to exons is that exon two skipping skips this sialic acid binding domain, but intron one retention would cause a skipping of the signaling peptide. And so this peptide is used to secrete CD33. It brings it out to the membrane and it secretes it. And so without this, you're changing that balance of CD33 protein inside and outside of the cell. So potentially a secondary effect to the uh, exon skipping. So we're quite excited about this. Mm -hmm. And then because I want to talk about Parkinson's disease, I'll show you one more example. Um, this is a gene CEPA1L2. And we can see here actually that we're getting the same events uh, throughout the two references, but we're also seeing the splice site difference here only in, in Genco and not in the novel. Um, but these are all really pointing towards the same events, and it's the 5' UTR of CEPA1L2. So we can see that the 5' UTR has one, two, three, four exons in it before the, the start codon down here, and actually the junction QTLs, the transcripts, and the exon skipping QTLs are all saying that it's this exon four that is being skipped more when you increase the, the dosage of the risk allele that gives you Parkinson's disease. And we can see actually that those these risk SNPs here, the lead GYS plus some others down here that are very highly um, associated with them, um, they're, they're co-inherited, sit actually within that exon as well. So we're finding a potential exon-specific effect for exon 4. And you see there's this variation in splice sites with some of these novel exons, but they're all targeting the same thing. So, um, and we can, we can plot this too. So uh, in summary, I think long read RNA-seq is a really exciting technology. We've been... Um, really lucky to, to work with it. And I think this increases our interpretive value of, of specific loci. Um, but ultimately, can we do this you know, only in long read RNA-seq? Uh, can we scale this up? And I'm, I'm not sure we can just yet, but that would be really exciting because all of this data I showed you is based on estimates from short read data, which is not perfect. It's a kind of black box in how you get the short reads to the isoforms. Ultimately, we want to do this only in long read RNA-seq. But then the bigger question beyond this is, how do we validate these associations? There's a wide range of tools now to, to validate expression-based associations, things like enhancers, CRISPR, multiple, uh, multi massively parallel reporter assays. But how do we do this for splicing? So we're still thinking about this. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. I'd just like to acknowledge my lab and say, of course, that we're trying to hire postdocs uh, to, to thank both Tafik, members of my lab, our collaborators, and of course, patients and families and you all for watching. So thank you very much. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to present some of our recent unpublished work characterizing the landscape of isoform diversity in the developing human neocortex. I'm Michael Gandel, I'm an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Genetics at the University of Pennsylvania, and this is a collaborative effort with my colleague, Luis De La Torre Uvieta at UCLA. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to point your attention to a, a recent preprint where you can read all of the details of what I'm about to present, shown here, uh, as well as an interactive web portal on our website where you can look at all of the individual level data for your favorite gene. 
So the development of the human brain is under tight molecular and genetic control. And understanding the principles of gene regulation that govern this highly canalized process uh, is critical for understanding the evolutionary complexity of the human brain and its contribution to higher order cognitive function. A critical period of human brain development occurs at mid gestation, roughly 15 to 25 weeks post conception, when there's a rapid period of neurogenesis. Mitotic progenitor cells from radioglia in the germinal zone of the neocortex undergo rapid proliferation, generating newborn neurons, which then migrate radially to the cortical plate. And as they do so, they begin maturing into excitatory neuron lineages. Not only is this period critical for neuronal proliferation, but it has also been strongly implicated as a vulnerability window for multiple neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disorders, including autism. Over the past decade, there have been a number of large scale studies using transcriptomics and genomic profiling to characterize the gene regulatory processes that occur across human brain development, both spatiotemporal transcriptome atlases, such as brain span, characterizing the regional and temporal trajectories of gene expression in the bulk transcriptome, as well as more recently with the advent of single cell sequencing technologies, a number of cell type specific gene expression atlases characterizing the specific underlying cell types and states in the developing brain. Now, while all of these data sets have greatly advanced our understanding of human brain development, they have all fundamentally taken what I call a gene centric view of these of this landscape. And this is based on the fact that they use second generation or short read RNA sequencing um, and that the underlying single cell sequencing protocols uh, typically sequence the three prime ends of a given gene. Now, this is an idealized view of a human gene, but we actually know that genes expressed in the human brain look something more like this. This is Ankrin 2 a high confidence autism risk gene, which has a large number of unique exons as shown here, as well as a large number of very complex splicing patterns shown here. And these splicing patterns and this combination of exons yields a large number of unique transcript isoforms. In the latest gen code annotation, in fact, there are 129 isoforms annotated to this gene of which 83 are predicted to be protein coding. And this is likely to be a vast underestimate. So we know that these human brain expressed genes, which tend to be longer and have uh, more exons than other genes expressed in the body, undergo very complex splicing patterns, and that these unique isoforms can have very different functional effects and be expressed in very different cell types. Indeed, it's been known for quite some time that RNA splicing is widespread and critical in the human brain during development. We know that the complexity of splicing is much greater in the human brain than other uh, non-brain tissues. This is important for evolution as well as regulation of neuronal cell fate, synapse development and excitability, um, and has notable relevance for disease. And so what we wanted to address here in this study was, can we leverage the recent development of third generation sequencing technologies, long read sequencing technologies, and in particular, PacBio HiFi uh, long read sequencing, to characterize the full isoform centric landscape of the human brain during a critical period of neurodevelopment. So to do this, we started with six neocortical samples from mid gestation post conception week 17 and micro dissected the cortical plates containing the maturing excitatory neurons from the germinal zone containing the mitotic progenitor cells. And using these micro dissected bulk tissue samples, we then performed high depth, long read hi-fi sequencing on a PacBio platform, followed by isoform identification and quantification using the Talon pipeline. And this enabled us to characterize with high depth, the bulk transcriptomes of both the germinal zone and cortical plate uh, during a critical period of neurogenesis. At the same time, we also leveraged single cell barcoding technology and 
generated single cell libraries from 7,000 cells, which we then sequence both on a pack bio machine again, as well as using the Illumina short read sequencing platform to generate a high depth coverage uh, for cell cluster identification. Now we can then match the barcodes, the unique cell barcodes and unique molecular indices that are added during single cell library preparation to directly assign each isoform identified from long read sequencing to a corresponding cell type from which it emerged. And this is building off of the scissor seek approach from Gupta et al. in 2018. So altogether, we generated over 33 million high quality circular consensus reads of the bulk transcriptome. And we uh, annotated these reads. Uh, we aligned them to the transcriptome, uh, to the genome and quantified them um, and characterized them using the nomenclature according to the Swanti QC pipeline, which compares the splice matches of a given isoform to the known reference annotation in this case from GenCode and, and characterizes isoforms as matching a known uh, transcript definition or being novel either uh, because it matches the five prime end, the three prime end of a known transcript or has a novel intron chain. Remarkably, only 30% of the transcripts that we identified in this data set were previously annotated in GenCode. In total, we identified 214,000 unique transcripts uh, expressed from 22,391 genes. While the, the majority of these uh, did match the known category, uh, a large fraction also came from what we consider novel in catalog, uh, as well as uh, this incomplete slice match category. Now, we performed extensive quality control to ensure that the reads supporting these novel isoforms were high quality, um, and in fact found that these novel transcripts, including the incomplete splice match transcripts, were significantly longer and contained more exons than the known expressed isoforms in the developing brain. We also found no evidence uh, that the read length distributions were any different between our long read sequencing compared with short read sequencing uh, using a uh, ribo zero preparation consistent with the high quality of the tissue that we were sequencing. In addition to identifying a large number of previously unannotated transcripts, we also identified a large number of novel spliced exons, uh, 7,000 in total, uh, which were expressed across 3,500 unique genes. We validated experimentally a, a handful of these uh, novel spliced exons successfully. Next, we wanted to leverage the fact that we had uh, multiple unique donors with multiple uh, regions from the same donor to compare patterns of differential transcript usage during neurogenesis. To do this, we compared differential gene expression, differential transcript expression, and differential transcript usage for the samples derived from the mitotic germinal zone compared to samples derived from the cortical plate, and these were paired samples. And what we observed was that, not surprisingly, there were a substantial number of genes that exhibited patterns of differential expression uh, across these two regions during neurogenesis. Um, and that the patterns of differential gene expression or the genes exhibiting differential gene expression largely overlap overlapped with the genes exhibiting differential transcript expression. In contrast, we identified a large number of genes that exhibited unique patterns of differential transcript usage. This is proportional shifts uh, or isoform switching uh, from uh, one isoform of a gene to another uh, across the two regions. Just to give you uh, an example, uh, an overview of the landscape of differential transcript usage, here I'm showing you the a volcano plot of genes with isoforms that exhibited a significant difference in isoform fraction between the cortical plate and the germinal zone. Everything above the red dotted line is genome or transcriptome wide significance. And what you can see here is that there's a large number of genes exhibiting isoform switching events, and that the majority, more than half, of the identified isoform switching events came from previously novel transcripts, so transcripts that did not match GenCode annotations. Just to give you an example, 
here I'm showing you a single gene, SMARC CC2. This is a known high confidence autism risk gene that functions in the BAF chromatin modifier complex. And we identified several novel transcripts of SMARC CC2 uh, as indicated by the Talon identifier here, as well as several known transcripts of this gene uh, shown by the ENST identifiers here. And what we can see is that while this gene does not show any difference in overall expression levels between the germinal zone and the cortical plate, several of the isoforms do show shifting uh, and, and specificity for one of the two regions. And in particular, it is these two novel isoforms as shown uh, with the, the talent identification that show the most significant uh, preference for expression or usage in the germinal zone compared to the cortical plate. And when we compare the exon structure and the peptide domains annotated to those, we can see significant differences between these novel isoforms and the annotated isoforms, both with a, an exon skipping event shown here, as well as an exon inclusion event at the three prime end of the gene. So how do we begin to make sense of all of these novel unannotated transcript isoforms, many of which are exhibiting patterns of differential usage uh, across regions in the developing human brain? Well, one way we sought to do this was to leverage a uh, guilt by association approach and place isoforms into a hierarchical classification using uh, network analysis, in this case, from the weighted gene correlation network analysis approach from Steve Horvath's lab. And so to do this, we generated isoform fraction or isoform usage networks, uh, co-expression networks, and, um, and built modules of highly co-expressed isoforms uh, across the um, developmental regions. And just to highlight one example, um, these are two of the top modules of isoform usage uh, uh, networks that we identified. And what we can see here is that um, in these two modules, module M1 and module M2, um, the hub genes, the most highly connected genes uh, or transcripts of this module, uh, contain isoforms of the uh, chromatin modifier SMARC E1 um, and distinct isoforms um, that have uh, differences in their either trans translational start or an exon skipping event. And by annotating the genes that are sort of co-regulated within these modules, we can begin to make sense of what these modules represent functionally, which then can give us insight into the functional relevance or significance of these isoform shifts we're observing uh, across neurogenesis. And so when we functionally annotate the, the genes in these two different modules, what we find is that the uh, genes in this M1 module are highly enriched for mitotic related pathways and progenitor cell populations shown here, whereas the isoform usage M2 modules shown here are highly, uh, the genes are highly enriched for neuron projection development ontologies um, and, uh, and excitatory neuron cell types, but not progenitor cell types. And so this provides insight that there's a shift from this isoform to these two isoforms as the mitotic progenitor cells begin to migrate and mature into uh, excitatory neurons uh, as they migrate radially in the developing neocortex. Next, we wanted to begin to connect these isoforms that we had identified with specific cell types in the developing brain. So we leveraged the fact that we had conducted uh, previously a large scale single cell sequencing study of the developing neocortex from Polydocus et al. in 2019 and identified 16 specific gene centric clusters uh, using those data. We then generated isoform level expression cluster maps and matched the, through matching of the cell barcodes and unique molecular indices are able to label the specific cell types present uh, in our isoform expression data and are able to recapitulate all the major developing cell types in the central nervous system. Interestingly, what we found was that excitatory neurons in general, both migrating and maturing excitatory neurons, harbored the greatest complexity and diversity of isoforms per gene uh, compared to all other cell types that we sequenced, suggesting that splicing is particularly important for this cell type, these cell lineages. We then sought to generate new clusters using our only our isoform level expression data. So taking the isoform level expression data, we generated clusters for, uh, for the cell types and identified many of the same, recapitulated many of the same underlying uh, cell type states that had been 
uh, consistent with the cell barcodes from short read sequencing. But remarkably, what we also were able to identify were several new excitatory neuron subtypes shown here that were present only at the isoform level, but not observed at the gene level. And these were uh, particularly apparent for these migrating uh, excitatory neuron lineages in which uh, a single cluster at the gene level split into three different unique clusters at the isoform level, providing a much more fine-grained annotation of the underlying cell types and states uh, present in the developing human brain. Using these isoform clusters, we also identified top marker genes uh, for each unique cell type, um, many of which recapitulated the well-known markers uh, for various cell types and cell states. But what we noted here that was quite interesting was that almost 20% of the cell type specific marker isoforms in this case came from previously unknown or unannotated isoforms, those beginning with the Talon ID that, that did not match the gen code database, um, really suggesting that uh, we are identifying isoforms here that have critical uh, importance for uh, cell type specification and lineage development. Lastly, we wanted to see if we could leverage this novel isoform-centric transcriptome annotation to gain new insights into the neurodevelopmental risk mechanisms of psychiatric, or the genetic risk mechanisms of neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders. As I mentioned up front, we know that this period of brain development is a critical window for the convergent impact of rare genetic variants associated with both autism and neurodevelopmental disorders more broadly. And so we sought to characterize which features of our isoform quantifications were most predictive or most associated with autism uh, and, RIT and neurodevelopmental disorder risk gene status more broadly. And what you can see here is that by far, the most predictive feature of a gene being either a neurodevelopmental disorder risk gene or an autism risk gene was the number of transcripts that we had identified, which is highly related to the number of exons also present in that gene. Likewise, we found that patterns of differential transcript usage, for example, were also, uh, and uh, presence in certain isoform expression or usage modules were predictive of risk gene status. To show this more concretely, uh, here we're, sh we're showing the number of transcripts identified per gene and the genes are ranked uh, on the x-axis by the number of transcripts. Um, and what you, what you can see here is that, again, the number of unique transcripts that we're identifying in the developing human brain for each gene is significantly predictive of whether that gene is an autism or a neurodevelopmental disorder risk gene um, with an odds ratio of about 1.8. So this tells us that the degree to which I, a gene is spliced uh, is a significantly um, a significant predictor uh, of whether this gene uh, can lead to a neurodevelopmental disorder. And finally, we wanted to turn to a, a large scale data set of actual genetic variants that had been identified and associated with, uh, identified from individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders and autism from whole exome and whole genome sequencing studies and use our isoform centric annotation to see if we could re-annotate and reprioritize the functional significance of these observed variants. And so of about 270,000 uh, variants that have been identified from a number of different sequ sequencing studies, um, we were able to successfully reprioritize uh, about 1% um, as having more severe consequences using our new reference annotation than previously predicted. And so I'll just highlight two examples here. Um, in this red box, uh, we are highlighting uh, de novo mutations that were previously predicted to be synonymous, meaning they did not alter the amino acid sequence of a given gene uh, based on the um, predicted previous transcriptome annotation. But using our new isoform-centric transcriptome annotation, these variants are now predicted to be missense variants, which are considered more severe in, uh, in consequence. To confirm the significance of this re-annotation, we also leveraged the recent Splice AI platform, which uses genome sequence to identify and predict the impact of sequence changes on cryptic splicing events in the transcriptome. And when we retrained the Splice AI algorithm using both known and our novel fetal brain expressed transcripts, we successfully 
identified a significantly increased proportion of rare de novo mutations that were predicted to alter, uh, have, have cryptic splice altering effects uh, in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. So altogether, here I presented you our work generating a comprehensive isoform-centric single cell atlas of the developing human brain at mid gestation. We've, this work has added over 175,000 new isoforms and well, as well as over 7,000 novel spliced exons, roughly corresponding about four megabases uh, to the coding genome. And we identify substantial changes in isoform usage and co-expression during this critical developmental time point, uh, which we use uh, to gain new insights into the molecular and cellular mechanisms uh, underlying neural fate specification neurogenesis. And finally, we show how we can leverage this resource to re-annotate and reprioritize neuropsychiatric risk variants. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and um, in particular acknowledge the individuals who drove this work, um, including uh, co-first authors Ashok Patawari, Pan Zhang, Connor Jops, as, as well as uh, Celine Wong from uh, and our, uh, the collaborative effort between the Ganda Lab and the Dilatory Uveda Lab uh, at UCLA. And thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions that you may have at this time. Great, um, fantastic talk, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Um, we have a few questions to get us started. Um, I will start with this one. Do you think the data shows there are novel subtypes of neuronal cells based on isoform expression patterns, or do you think the additional level of detail provided by isoform expression patterns allow us to more accurately define specific neuronal subtypes? I think you're on mute, Mike. Still Can you guys hear me? There we go. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that that's really a, a fantastic question, and um, it's something that we're actively working to address right now, which is really to understand, you know, are there novel sort of isoform specific subtypes? Um, we didn't have the sort of resolution to really answer that question. Um, with this data set, but it's it's certainly something that we're working to do now um, as we increase the size of our, our future um, sequencing efforts. Okay, great. Um, we have a question, and I think there was another question earlier about this, um, about differential. Um, so what packages did you use to compare differential transcript expression differential transcript usage and differential gene expression? And is this based solely on long reads or short reads, short reads mapped to the long read transcriptome? And then maybe Liz, you can also chime in and just talk about differential expression in general, especially with the upcoming MOS bulk kit. Yeah, so, um, so this is also a, a really um, great question and something that we had done a lot of internal work in our lab playing around with different pipelines and trying to understand sort of or get a feel for, for how they performed in these different situations. Um, and so ultimately, we for the data that I presented in terms of transcript usage, different differences in differential gene and transcript expression, we were only using the long read sequencing data. Um, so collapsed accounts and then for um, for differential gene expression, we just uh, took all of the transcripts for a given gene, summed them up, and so now you have a count for that gene. Um, and then we just use standard package uh, DESeq2 uh, for differential gene expression. Um, for differential transcript expression, we did basically the same thing, except didn't collapse the reads to the gene. We just um, assumed that each isoform was independent of each other uh, and, and looked at it that way. Um, and then for the D, uh, for the different tr differential transcript usage quantification, which is this sort of fractional shifting uh, or isoform switching events, um, we ended up using the DEC seq pipeline, the DEX seq uh, pipeline, which is implemented in this R package called Isoform Switch Analyzer, um, and uh, that worked uh, pretty well in our hands. We also compared it to the DRIM seq pipeline, which also gave very similar results.
um, this question for DTU and DGE. Um, you only used the long read RNA seq data, or did you use R short read and incorporate it, those into analysis? Yeah, so we we had previously used short read data to quantify patterns of differential gene expression and local splicing shifts um, between the cortical plate and the germinal zone. Um, we did not do here um, like a transcript assembly approach that would incorporate both the short and the long read sequencing data together in a quantification sense. Um, there are a few packages, uh, methods that do this, like string tie now, um, and I believe isoquants also allows you to do this. Um, but we uh, we we um, just simply use the the long read sequencing data for for this analysis and and got some you know pretty substantially significant results. Okay, um, maybe while we're on this topic, there were questions earlier. Um, what depth of sequencing would you recommend for differential isoform usage analysis? Um, and then is quantification possible without short read? Liz, do you want to address those? Oh, you're on mute now, Liz. Um, I think I want to defer this to the open discussion. And also, I know you asked about mass bulk. So since Mike's, uh, he talked mostly about the single cell portion of his paper, Let's let's talk about it in the open discussion. Okay, sounds great. Um, let's see, we've got another question about differential analysis. I'll probably hold that. Did you validate with PCR for the uh, DTU cases? Uh, so the the thing, so what we validated with PCR were the uh, transcript ice the novel transcript isoforms um, that um, contained these uh, spliced exons that didn't overlap any previous exons that we had seen before um, and so we wanted to make sure that these isoforms that we were detecting that have what we looked like a novel exon where it was actually now uh, was actually um, being um, Express them. So we used RT-PCR for, for that uh, to, to validate those, those novel spliced exons. Okay. Um, one more coming in. Is the reference transcriptome made by your group? Um, does it have non-coding RNA um, and small RNA? Yeah, so we, we've made um, all of our data is publicly available. As I mentioned, you can go to our website um, uh, or look at the, the preprint um, that we have on MedArchive or BioArchive, one of the two. Um, and so it, it definitely includes genes that are non-coding. I mean, we, we don't, um, there's, uh, ma many of the, the genes and, and isoforms are, are going to be uh, non-coding. Um, I don't know how small they get, actually. That's a good question. We certainly didn't do any kind of selection for like micro RNAs or, or, or smaller RNA products. And I do believe there's probably some um, some loss of, of the, re the super small um, uh, transcripts just like in, in the sequencing process. And so I would bet that we're, we're not gonna see anything that small, but um, but we definitely have non-coding uh, non uh, transcripts there. Perfect. Okay, so we are going to go ahead. Thank you, Mike um, and Liz. And I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next session. So we have a talk by um, Keepin from PacBio, who's going to talk about visualization. Um, again, there is no live Q&A after this talk. Um, following that, we will move right into our session two, the translational research portion with Anise's talk. Hi everyone, my name is Kipin. I'm a bioinformatics scientist with PacBio in the Computational Biology Group. In PacBio, one of the things that we have been thinking is how to actually make visualization better to help you to go from BASQ or BAMS to ANSWER. One of the things that 
we are working on is what we call a transcripts dashboard for ISOSIG. And this is based on Shiny app. I've created this app whereby we can actually visualize transcripts that's generated from smart link analysis of ISOSIG results. And I'm going to walk you through how it looks like right now. This is obviously a non-official, non-supported software for now, but if there is enough interest, in, there's obviously opportunity to make this into something that's more um, mature and supported in the future. If you're interested in actually using this for your ISOSIC data, definitely reach out to us and I can share with you a URL where you can access, can access this for free. Now, the first question you might have is, why do we want to design this when you can actually visualize GFF or GTF generated from ISOSIC analysis in IGV, right? And that's a very good question. There's obviously advantage in IGV in that it is a very well-established software and it allows you to even visualize read alignments. However, there are aspects of isosic analysis where IGD does not natively support. And so that could be, for example, the count of each of the transcripts, right? So you can visualize an entire arrays of isoforms that's generated from isosic analysis, but you can't tell which one of it is the most abundant, which one of it is the least abundant. And the other thing is that with Pigeon, which is basically a transcripts classification software, you can also tell that whether a transcript is actually matching what's already in the reference transcriptome or not, right? And IGV, again, does not have that straightforward way of, of visualizing it. And so we want to actually have a dashboard that is very simple. Of course, it's not as, as um, full-fledged as IGV, but it allows us to visualize the various aspects of ISOC results from SmartLink. Okay, so I think I've spoken enough and I'm just going to jump into the app where I will show you what it can do, right? So this app takes in a GFF that's um, generated by ISOSIC. It can actually be any GFF, it doesn't have to be from SmartLink. If you just want to visualize GFF, you can actually use a GFF, any GFF. It takes in optionally a pigeon classification file. So this would be a file that has for each isoforms whether it is actually matching the reference transcriptome or is it a novel transcripts or any other categories that's generated by pigeon you can actually upload multiple files for both of this input and so if you upload multiple files just make sure anything that be anything before the first dot in the file names match Right, so it will actually know that okay, this particular GFF and this particular classifications they are actually from the same experiment. Okay, so if you have multiple runs, for example, you want to compare multiple different um, GFF, you can do that. Now let's start with something simple. If you go to our website, you will actually find a couple of demo data set, and so one of them is, for example, a ISOC experiment from Alzheimer back in 2019, and there is also the mass bulk. Um, data set that's uh, from very recent months, right? So if we look at the MassBob HG002 data set, we'll open up the GFF file and then we will get the pigeon classification file in, right? So you can see, as you can see, for both of these files, the name before the first dot is actually the same, right? So we're going to get that uploaded, okay? And you can see immediately after I upload pigeon classification TXT file, you can see a plot shows up on the right, right? And this is actually the percentage of full length reads that's assigned to each category. So if you look at the classification file, you can see that there is many, many isoforms, but there is actually a column that says, okay, how many length, full length reads are actually belong to these particular isoforms, right? And so this summarizes that counts and tells you that, oh, okay, there's actually 78% of reads that belong to full splice mesh, which is not surprising at all because we expect majority of isoforms to, to ha have already been discovered, especially those that's very abundant, right? So uh, a lot of the reads should belong to this full splice mesh if the experiment is work working well. 
There's a couple of novel transcripts here, and that um, comprises of about 10% of the reads, which is still quite a, a lot of reads if you think about it. So that means there is actually a lot of novel transcripts that we are not discovering in the reference transcript. The total number of reads is 25 million here, right? And this number is basically after all the artifacts filtering um, by SmartLink analysis. Okay, so now let's visualize the isoform. So um, one of the questions that we frequently get is that can the mass bulk um, experiments, for example, capture full length uh, transcripts of long isoforms, right? So I'm going to cherry pick one of the genes that is ex extremely long, and that's mTOR, right? So we know mTOR is a very, has a very, very long mRNA isoforms, and we want to know, hey, can we actually capture that, right? And so once you type in the gene names, it's going to take some time to load. Um, but once it gets loaded up, the next time you change to another gene, it's actually going to be pretty quick, right? And this is because we're trying to load the entire um, reference transcriptome in. So now you can see the GFF is getting visualized at the bottom of the screen. And it's a little bit cramped, and that's because we have a lot of isoforms for this particular gene that's um, generated from smartling analysis. So here, there's a height of transcript plot where you can adjust to make it easier to read, right? So now you can see now it looks a lot better, right, at a 1,200 pixel. The other thing you would notice is that there is a lot of points that are the same. They are very low count here. You can, if you mouse over the transcripts on the right, this is actually the count of each of these isoforms, right? And, and this, is, this demonstrates one of the advantages that I mentioned where we can actually visualize um, ISO6 specific analysis um, much better than IGV, right? So here, this is the full length count, which is the isoforms. And you can see that on the left, these are all the isoforms um, with different IDs, right? These are the IDs that's generated by ISO6 analysis. And on the bottom in blue, these are actually the reference transcripts from GenCode database, which is what we use to classify the transcripts, right? And so first, firstly, just to make this less busy, we will filter out those with a full length count of just two, right? And you can do that by clicking on this. This is going to bring it down. So this is two, right? So we don't get set three. So anything below three is gonna get filtered out. Okay, so now it's a lot cleaner, right? And you can see that um, we have some of these transcripts that are Incomplete splice match. So you can mat match the point here with the legend on the right, and it says full splice match is in green, incomplete splice match is in yellow, right, or orange. Now, um, there is quite a bit of incomplete splice match, which means that um, during the transcriptions process, um, the, uh, the poly A priming actually stops um, before, the, uh, before it's actually able to completely transcribe the entire isoforms, right? And this is Pretty normal for our SSIC, um experiments, but if you go down to this particular isoforms where it is actually super long, you can see that this is actually a comp, uh, full splice match. And if you mouse over the transcript itself, you can see the different exons um, start and end, and it also says the length of this isoform is 8.6 kilobase pair. It's pretty amazing, right? We um, we have 26 reads that are uh, covering this 8.6 kilobase pair isoforms completely, right? And I think this is pretty cool. Now, if you mouse over the full splice match point, it also tells you which one of the reference transcripts is it matching to. So here it says 361445. If you scroll down, you can see that there's a 361445 right at the bottom. And there's some information on this particular gene. It is from Havana source. Um, it's a protein coding transcripts, and it has an ensemble support level one, which is the highest support level, which means that this transcript is pretty well curated, right? And there are other transcripts that are not so well curated. You can see ensemble or support level three. So these are generally transcripts that may not be as well curated, right? Um, so the bottom one, you can see this is actually 8.6 KB. And there, it also tells you which exon it is. The arrow tells us the uh, uh, transcription direction, obviously. So five prime to three prime, this is from the right to the left, right? And if you're interested in looking into a specific region, you can actually zoom in, 
Okay, so let's say I'm zooming in here. So now you can see that, uh, okay, uh, it's a lot clearer how different pattern of transcription is, right? Okay, so here, for example, you can see that the majority of them, um, in fact, all of them are actually transcribing this uh, part of the uh, exon structures, okay? All right, so that's for uh, this particular one. Now, I mentioned we can actually compare multiple experiments. Um, so if you upload the pigeon GFF for the Alzheimer one, as well as this mass bulk one, we to upload both of their classification as well as their GFF, okay? So we'll just give it a few seconds. And then for isoforms, let's look at WDR4, which is a known um, isoforms that's related to um, uh, neurological disease, right? So this is going to take a little bit of time. It's getting uploaded. So here it is. You can see that comparing both experiments, right? The Alzheimer experiments back in 2019 actually had a high percentage of reads that's assigned to novel isoforms. And we know brain uh, Alzheimer disease um, has a lot of alternative splicing that's going on. So this actually makes sense. But what's cool is that here you can now put these two experiments side by side and do that comparison, right? Um, where for the HG002 mass bulk, uh, majority of reads are actually full splice match. Whereas for um, Alzheimer, it uh, drops by about 17% and majority of them actually go into novel in catalog, right? Okay, so if we now scroll down, you can see WDR4. Okay, so there is two color now for the GFF visualization. The orange one is actually from the mass bulk experiment. It has a much higher depth, so which, which means that we're going to discover uh, quite a bit more isoform. So it makes sense that it has a lot more entries than the Alzheimer experiment. For the Alzheimer experiment here, there's actually three isoforms that's discovered for WDR4, and all three of them are actually full splice match, okay? Now, the interesting thing here I, I wanted to point out is that if you notice that in the mass bulk tissue, the top most abundant transcripts actually has um, uh, the, this last exon here that's um, actually being expressed, right? So it has, um, 401 reads that's, that's assigned to these particular isoforms. First of all, the second most abundant one is actually um, this one that doesn't have the last exon. If you mouse over, you can see that the second one is 398203 in the reference transcriptome, and the top one is actually 330317 for the, most, for the first um, isoforms. If you then go down to the Alzheimer um, ones, you can see that the top most, the most abundant one is actually 398208 which is actually the second most abundant one in the mass bulk experiment, right? So if, you, if we now lower the full length count that was filtering, um, we wanted to see if we can actually see the long isoforms in Alzheimer's experiment. And sure enough, it actually is there, right? It's actually this particular one, but it has very low count, just two. So it looks like in the Alzheimer's uh, tissue, there's a flip of the isoform usage, right? So and you can actually see that from this particular experiment. Obviously, because the depth is actually quite low, it statistically it may not be that significant, but this gives you kind of that clue on, on you know, perhaps you want to think about sequencing deeper, for example. I should also say that these are all counts, they're not TPM, so technically it, it might not make uh, a lot of sense to kind of compare that numbers, but the pattern is there, right? And in the future, we, we, we will have TPM that in the classification file, and then we can actually um, think about visualizing TPM instead to make it comparable between experiments, um, as comparable as they can. Obviously, um, there is still normalization that needs to be done. Okay, I hope I have um, talked to you enough about how this transcript dashboard works. Again, please do let us know if you are interested in an app like this. We're trying to gauge interest from people, um, how much of a need there is for a visualization app like this. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm certainly happy to share this with anyone who's interested um, in, in this for uh, early testing or early usage, right? It's available for free, okay? Thank you very much for your time.
Hi, uh, my name is Anis Shahnai, and I'm a graduate student at Dr. Chan's lab at Sanford Burn on Premise uh, Medical Discovery Institute. Today, I'm going to talk about single cell isoform uh, sequencing in neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative diseases comprise a group of complex and devastating disorders characterized by the progressive uh, degeneration of neurons in peripheral nervous system or central nervous system. It includes Alzheimer's disease, Huntington disease, and Parkinson's disease. Traditionally, research uh, into these disorders has largely focused on the genetic aspects of uh, the disease, like uh, examining specific genes associated with uh, disease susceptibility. Uh, but recent advances in molecular biology and um, high throughput sequencing technologies have uncovered a layer of complexity in the form of um, alternative splicing. Uh, as you know, alternative splicing is various versions of the same gene that arises due to the variations in exon inclusion or exclusion during uh, transcription. So why we are interested in doing single cell? Because there's lots of different cell types that have different functions in a tissue. And why we are using isoforms? Because gene expression may not differ uh, between two cell types or cell types in different states, like disease versus control. But isoforms of uh, particular genes may be different. Uh, so how we do single cell isoform sequencing? So we have our um, tissue of interest. We um, isolate the prefrontal cortex. We do the nuclei isolation and create the, the cDNA uh, barcoded um, library using 10x chromium. Then we split the library to sequence with short read and long read. So a short read sequencing is for cell type identification and differential gene expression and long read is for cell type specific uh, isoform analysis. So why uh, we are using single cell isoform sequencing in the brain and why is it important? So because of cellular heterogeneity, the brain is a really complex organ composed of diverse cell types and each of these cell types have distinct function. Single cell isoform sequencing allows us to study the diversity of gene expression and isoform usage across different cell types. Also, uh, single cell isoform sequencing enables the identification of specific uh, cell-specific isoform profiles, which uh, happens by alternative splicing. Also, with single cell uh, isoform um, sequencing uh, in diseased brain, uh, we can reveal how isoform expression differs between healthy and diseased brain, and we can find a new uh, disease mechanism. The other thing is functional diversity, which uh, by studying isoform usage in single cells, we can see how these uh, isoforms contrib contribute to neuronal function. And the last is personalized medicine, which allows us uh, to provide a comprehensive view of uh, isoform expression patterns uh, in individual brains, and it helps uh, helps to develop uh, personalized uh, treatment strategies. Uh, according to the previous work in the lab, uh, we use single cell long read sequencing to profile Down syndrome brain across age. In this study, we identify cell type specific isoform usage, but we needed more depth to fully characterize isoform expression. This slide uh, shows read count comparison between short read and long read. And on the left, this is a knee plot uh, we generated from Cell Ranger, which is a QC metric for 10x sequencing. The knee plot shows the number of cells that have at least a certain number of UMIs, uh, like a thousand cells with thousand UMIs. Uh, and on the right, you can see a same plot uh, for uh, PacBio isosic method, and the green uh, is a cutoff for 100 reads, and the red is a cutoff for 15, uh, 50, uh, 50 genes. Um, 
this uh, slide show a few how few UMIs per cell are detected in long read sequences, uh, sequencing versus short read. And as you can see, uh, short read has a better uh, throughput. Uh, according to our Down syndrome uh, paper, uh, because we didn't have that much uh, throughput, we ended up PCR amplifying individual genes like APP, BIM1, and SPP1 to get a better coverage. So basically, we designed a primer and select the region of interest, and we amplified it and did the analysis. So the caveat of this method is that we miss uh, some isoforms that uh, don't contain that primer sequence. Uh, in another project in the lab, uh, we use a targeted approach by Trees Bioscience. Uh, in this method, we designed a 50 gene panel probe set to target isoform from those genes. The goal of this study was to increase the read count on these genes to fully examine the isoforms. Uh, as you can see, you have your gene of interest and with the design probe, you can amplify the desire, desired sequence. It works by tiling the probes across the exon of interest. And the reason why we chose that uh, over the targeted PCR method uh, was um, because it can uh, capture more isoforms in comparison to the targeted PCR method. The limitation of twist method is just it's uh, limited to a gene panel. And the greater the number of genes, the fewer reads you can get uh, for examining isoforms. Now there is a new technology uh, called MOSSIC, which uh, is commercialized by PacBio, uh, which is a short form of multiplex, uh, multiplexing array sequencing. And we use this technique uh, for our new project. So in this project, we have 16 sample, uh, samples AD group and control group. We uh, dissect the frontal cortex. We did the nuclei isolation, and we created our um, cDNA barcoded library, uh, library using 10 10x chromium, and we split the cDNA library into short read and uh, MOSSIC long read sequencing using PacBio in house. Uh, this is a, on the left, you can see the MOSIC workflow. Uh, it has uh, some steps and it's about approximately a two day protocol. And one of the important part of this protocol is mass array formation. So basically you have your cDNA library, you divide it into uh, N sets of uh, PCR reaction. And after that, you pull out all this reaction and ligate the cDNAs together and form your array. So basically, your array contain, contains 16 cDNA that they're sticking together. And then you can do the pack bio sequencing on them. This slide uh, shows MOSIC data quality. And PacBio uh, recommends this ideal value, and we are in the range of it. And as you can see here, um, you need at least 1.5 million hi-fi reads uh, to get over 30 million segmented reads. And depending on your 10x library, the size of the segmented reads uh, is going to vary. And PacBio uh, aims around 600 base pair, which um, is interesting. Uh, we are uh, doing really well, and very uh, high percentage of our reads have the full array, and uh, we are getting a good array size. Um, uh, this slide shows uh, the knee plots for MOSIC, ISOSIC, and short read uh, sequencing. On the right, you can see the knee plot for MOSIC, which uh, shows that it has a better throughput in comparison to isosic, and it's getting closer to uh, short read uh, throughput. So uh, we are in the beginning of this project, and that's why I don't show uh, more data. But as I showed in the previous slide, uh, MOSIC can increase the throughput, and the initial analysis on uh, our 16 samples uh, 
were, they were uh, look really good and we are excited to see more data from it. Uh, so for our future work, uh, we would like to see that can masik increase the throughput in the brain so uh, we don't need to use short read for cell type identification. Also, we want to validate the novel isoforms and see if they're real and uh, can they uh, translate into protein. Uh, also, we would like to investigate uh, into disease-specific uh, isoforms to figure out how they contribute to uh, disease pathology. Uh, as I said, uh, we are new in this project, but uh, our initial analysis look really good, and we are excited to see more about this. So this is the end of my talk, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Chan Lab and Dr. Gerald Chan and all my lab mates, especially Dr. Christine Liu, which she uh, always helps everybody in the lab. Thank you so much. Hi, Anise. Hi. For a great talk. Um, Liz, do you want to kick things off? Questions? Yeah. So thanks for um, giving this talk, Anise. Um, I have some questions. So you showed two slides where you first showed a targeted aplicon sequencing and then later like the twist probes. Was that just on the APP gene? Um, uh, Twist had, it was a panel for Twist. So we okay. used like 50 genes panel for okay. Twist. Was it a custom genes panel or you guys actually, there was like an existing panel design? Yeah, it was custom panel. Okay. And so you also mentioned that like, you know, with the custom, you can kind of get around with needing to do primer design. Maybe I missed that, but these were still done. These were definitely done on bulk, not single cell, right? Uh, no, it was, uh, single cell. Oh, okay. How was it done? So this was done before MASIC, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what were the findings from doing the panel for using the twist? Uh, so the findings, uh, it increased the red depth and uh, on that genes uh, that we were looking to, but unfortunately it was limited only to just 50 genes. Right, so since it's only 50 genes, it's not like you could do like, well, you just can't do like cell type clustering or whatnot, is that right? Yeah, okay, exactly. but you were able to like see more isoforms. Yeah. I see, okay. And that was, was that choice done before MOS single cell came along? Yeah, it was before MOS seek. Okay, so now with, I know you said that you're still like analyzing the MOS seek. is this MOS single cell data done on the same, um, aging down syndrome brain or alzheimer's brain that was in the previous publications um in the project that we did the twist two of the samples are we use them again in the mastic project mm -hmm. and what do you think you what is the kind of like the hope of what you would see now with a greater depth um actually we are uh, able to uh i think yeah you're able to cluster uh, with or without short read mm -hmm. and we'll identify the cell types uh, and see generally more isoforms across um, more genes for more genes. Okay, cool. All right. Um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Maybe um, while we're kind of on this topic of MOSSE, we can ask a question from um, a previous session. Um, there was a question about size selection bias when concatenating into the 16-segment array in MOSSeq. Um, and so maybe for Liz, is it worth size selecting cDNA for longer fragments going into um, the array step? Yeah, so I think that was specific for single cells since um, that's the one that the kit we have on market you now um, for 10x cDNA, it's generally pretty short. They're usually 600 to 800 bases. Actually, Anise, I noticed yours was 400 bases, which is um, was a little shorter than what I usually see. I'm actually thinking if it's like just the the the, the brain samples are a little more degraded or something. But yeah, don't do size selection. For mass bulk, we'll also, you know, as we launch the care, we'll also show you that um, there will be 
um, not really size selection, but we're going to do bead cleanups, and that does change. We have a standard size recommendation, but with moss bulk, as you can see the data that I showed, you're still going to get 10 kilobase um, transcripts even with concatenation. Okay. Um, I think that's it for questions. Again, if you have any questions for Nice, feel free to add them to the chat and we'll address them in the open discussion at the end. Uh, thanks, Denise. Um, yeah. We will now move on to our last pre-recorded talk and followed by Q&A, um, Emil Gustafsson from uh, UCL. Thanks. So hi everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Emil Gustafsson and I'm a research fellow at UCL in London. And today I'm going to talk about our work on using long read RNA seq on genes implicated in neurodegenerative disease. So first I want to start off by saying to interpret any genetic data you require a map. And I would argue that having an accurate map or annotation has probably never been more important than right now. And the reason for that is we needed to understand basic gene function and so on we needed for the variant interpretation and uh, annotation. And subsequently, we needed for accurate diagnosis of genes implicated in uh, monogenic Mendelian disease. And last, we, we needed for design of accurate gene therapies, particularly for when considering uh, antisense nucleotide oligons. So the current transcriptome build are, is a working model uh, with variable accuracy. And what I mean by that is that it's been built largely by using a protein sequence and an express, expressed sequence tags. And subsequently, it's been used to using short read RNA seq data. So the process then of uh, creating this annotation is uh, an automated, but also part of it is manual. We have to merge transcript to come up with unique transcript models. And again, I want to highlight that the problem with this using short read RNA seq data is that most of these reads only span a single junction, and therefore it's hard to actually infer transcripts, complete transcript structures. Another problem with this is that when you have a uh, Gene, part of the genome that is uh, highly homologous. And this one example of that is with pseudogenes, as there are 14,000 of them in the human genome. Mapping becomes a difficulty. So what I'm going to present today is some of our data on then using long read RNA sequencing of genes implicated in neurogenesis disease. And I'll kind of split this into three categories. One, looking at transcripts accounting for a large proportion of expression. Two, to look at low usage transcript of potentially significant importance. And three, to look at novel transcripts in cell type specific states and in cell types specific expression. So first I want to start with GBA. So GBA, or now known as GBA1, encodes uh, glucocerebrosidase. And what it does is that uh, it uh, hydrolyzes glucosyl ceramide into glucose and ceramide. And we have mutations in GBA. Uh, you get the accumulation of substrate in the lysosome in the cell. And mutations then in GBA when uh, um, biallelic Costco share disease and when heterozygous is the strongest risk factor for Parkinson's disease and the progression to dementia in Parkinson's disease. So why is GBA so interesting? Why do I think the annotation is wrong here? Well, I kind of highlighted that a bit earlier where we have pseudogenes and their parent genes which share a high sequence similarity. And here for GBA, it sh shares actually 96% sequence similarity to uh, GBA pseudogene 1. And it's in the 95th percentiles when you actually rank all parent pseudogene pairs. And the consequence of this is obviously that with short reads or RNA sequencing, you likely have maps that multi map. To explore this more in detail, we used a short read RNA sequencing data that is 100 base pair read and paired end reads. And it's highly um, with a high read depth of 182 million reads per sample. And here we find that only 41.7% of all reads actually map uniquely to GBA. And it, it, it for turn that around, it means that about 60% of all reads that map to GBA multiple. And when they do so, as you can see in the B panel here, they largely do so to the pseudogene. Actually, 96% of them do. So obviously, this will have complications or uh, implications for annotation of these genes, or actually both of them genes. So to address this, we then use targeted isoseq. So I have the protocol highlighted on the left there, which is then. Um, uh, we do the um, enrichment or the targeting using uh, hybridization probes here. With, uh, this is IDT we use in this example. 
And this is from RNA of control samples with re high RIN value. So this is about eight and above. And on the top here, I'm showing the, the, the transcripts we find for GBay itself. Uh, uh, it's worth noting here that before getting here, there's a lot of QC in terms of uh, what we actually call a transcript, and we validate them with the KGIC data and so on. But in the interest of time, I kind of left that out now. Anyways, the most surprising thing to us is, is this green bar here, which represents the novel coding uh, transcripts of GBay. And when I say novel coding, that means that it's a um, transcript that has an open reading frame, uh, which is not predicted to undergo NMD. Again, all of these transcripts that we have classified here are found in all the 12 brain regions that we actually sequence, which are listed here on the, on the right. Next, I want to highlight the fact that in GBay, which is such a well-studied gene, we don't find a single dominant transcript, where the most highly, highly expressed transcript only represents about 38% of transcription. And you can see here on the fourth transcript itself is a, a novel protein coding transcript. And when you aggregate it, you can see that about 35% encoded nucleus and 20% in thalamus are actually predicted to be novel protein coding transcripts. On the bottom here, I'm showing the same thing, but for GBase pseudogene. And here, the most surprising thing is that we actually find transcripts that are predicted to be protein coding, again, with the same definition of having open reading frame, not predicted to undergo NMD. And we can see that this represents about 10 to 15% of transcription, depending on brain region we're looking at. So next, we want to see what could be the functional implications of, of such transcripts. So here I, like, I have um, plotted the most highly expressed transcript of the novel ones, protein coding, and similarly for GBase pseudogene one at the bottom. And what we've done is we used alpha fold, and we look at the, 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 the folding of these potential protein uh, products. And we see here, first we have the main select, so the most, uh, well, the most highly expressed GBA transcripts, which we have actually crystal, crystal structure form. And we can see that all of these, which are uh, represent shorter isoforms of GBA itself, are predicted to have the same folding towards the C terminus, but lacking parts of the N terminus. Similarly, when we do the same thing for, for the pseudogene, and this is probably more interesting, is that we find that when you overlap the, the crystal structure of GBA itself with the pseudogene, we find that the folding is highly similar between them, but again, lacking parts of the N-terminus of, of the protein itself. Next, we wanted to explore whether these actually are translated in, 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 in brain. So what we used here is mass spec data, and we couldn't really do this for GBA itself since all the isoforms are shorter and therefore doesn't have any novel sequences to them or unique sequences. But for the pseudogene, we actually have these unique stretches and we can find, uh, we can detect this in human dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Again, to kind of understand what, what the consequence of these kind of shorter transcripts or the GBA pseudogene transcripts uh, would be, we have again done an alignment to the main select transcript which is blue at the bottom here, so the, the canonical. And we see then that the GBA, the novel ones that I highlighted previously, are just short isoforms and affecting either the signal peptide needed for the translocation to the lysosome, or they affect the, the glycohydro 30 domain, which is needed for the hydroxylysis or glycosyl ceramide. Similarly, for GBA pseudogene, we find the same thing where you either affect the signal peptide or partially affect the glycohydro 30 domain, so we wouldn't have an intact structure. But to see if these actually are protein coding, uh, remember we could only look at the pseudogene in, 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 in living tissue. We looked at, uh, we actually made construct of all of these transcripts using a, a flag tag. And we overexpressed them in a, a H4 cell line that's lacking uh, endogenous GBA. And again, you can see that all of the predicted uh, transcript structures are protein coding in this, or translated in the system. But, and remember, we, we, we thought that most of these would affect the glycohydro domain and therefore probably ha don't have this enzymatic activity. And sure enough, when they express them in this, uh, in, again, in a cell line that doesn't express endogenous GBA, we find no uh, enzymatic activity above uh, baseline. Only the only transcript here is the main select when we transfected that. Similarly, when we have a parental cell line which actually has endogenous GBA, we don't see that the, the, the enzymatic activity is affected by expression of these additional transcripts. And lastly, uh, with this is some preliminary data showing that when we uh, express it and we then mark with Ketepsin D, which is a lysosomal marker, we find that the only transcript that actually goes to the lysosome is the main select transcript, suggesting for GBA itself, uh, about a third of potential protein is not in the lysosome and does not have this, uh, I guess, um, known enzymatic activity. 
But to better understand where we find expression of this transcript, we first used a uh, five prime single nucleus RNA sequencing data. So this is short read data. And we then expressed again, here is a few more of them, but we express, uh, well, we, we particularly look at five prime entities and we find that most of the expression is either in oligodendrocytes or uh, excitatory neurons, which is here cortical neurons, or to some extent uh, astrocytes. But if we find that they're absent in, in microglia and almost absent in inhibitor neurons. And we find exactly the same pattern for, for G-based pseudogene uh, one. We find that most of the expression here is, is in excitatory neuron, to some extent oligodendrocytes, and a bit in astrocytes. But again, here we have a problem with multi-mapping. So we did a similar assay, but we now use uh, iPSC drive the cortical neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. And we then look at the expression for these transcripts. And again, we find that most of the expression is in either in excitatory neurons or astrocyte. And we find very little expression in microglia. And we see exactly the same pattern for G-based pseudogene 1, which is then confirming what we find from the short read RNA sequencing. So that was the story of a lot of uh, a lot of novel transcription, or I guess a lot novel transcription representing a large proportion of what we actually find from this low time. But to look at uh, cases where we have a low usage transcript of potentially significant importance, we started looking at APOE. So APOE is uh, the most most I guess the most well known risk factor of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, where we find that when we look at annotated, so this is uh, sequencing. Uh, whole transcriptome isoseq from five uh, AD samples and four controls. And when we look at annotated transcript, we find very little uh, differential expression, partially to some extent for this one, but most of it seems to be similar. However, from a previous study from the lab, we looked at uh, regions of the gene genome with human lineage specificity. And these are regions that are uh, uh, non-conserved but constrained. And interesting, we find one of these regions overlapping with intron free of APOE itself. And even more interesting is when we look at the short read RNA sequence data, we see an increased coverage of this intron. Uh, and we find this overlapping them with the, the human lineage specific uh, region. What we did then is that we used uh, data from ROSMAP. Uh, so this is a short read RNA sequence data from uh, Alzheimer's disease and controls. And first, we looked at uh, across brain regions, and we can see that we find this uh, uh, interintention happening across brain regions, uh, although most highly in spinal cord and nigra. But what's more interesting is that when we look at uh, the AD samples, we find that uh, with increased uh, BRAC staging, so this is a, me a pathological measurement of uh, severity of disease in Alzheimer's, uh, represented by new neurofibrillary tangles, we find that more severe disease have more of these interintention events happening. Similarly, when you have the risk factor in APOE, so the E4 allele, we also find an increased expression of this interintention event in, in Alzheimer's disease. To so then see if this is actually a, a, a misplacing, if this actually represents stable transcripts, we again used a short read, oh, sorry, a long read um, targeted sequencing. And we did this in cortical neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. And here again, we find uh, this interintention being present of three individual transcripts. They all seem to be more highly expressed towards in microglia, but with some, with some variability of it. Similarly, we find that in this last X, and we actually find the intronization event, uh, which then means that the two alleles represented the E4 allele, which are actually two uh, SNPs that are uh, non synonymous are, are not now present on an intron, meaning that this exon has been uh, alternative spliced to include an intron within it. And again, we find that this is most, most commonly present in, in neurons and uh, treated microglia. Lastly, I want to talk about novel transcripts in cell type specific states and in cell type uh, with cell type specificity. And here we looked at Brazilian 2. So, Brazilian 2 is a, a gene known to cause uh, familial uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease. And here again, we sequenced uh, neurons, astrocytes, and microglia, and we find these short isoforms or isoforms with um, alternatively spliced uh, exons here, which are supposed to be condon and condon. And again, we find that these novel transcripts represented here are almost highly expressed in, in cortical neurons with very little expression in microglia. However, when we, we use an inflammatory uh, stimulus, we find that the, the, the expression of these transcripts goes up in both astrocytes uh, and to some extent in microglia suggesting that they might be a part of a response to inflammatory uh, stimulus. 
So to conclude this, we find that for GBA, a third of all transcription is potentially novel protein coding, and around 10% of all GBA transcription is translated. When we look at the more rare transcript, we find that uh, expression of APE intron retaining transcript are associated with, with Alzheimer's disease and potentially affect the, the penetrance of the E4 allele. And lastly, we find that novel Brazilian 2 transcripts expression is uh, cell type selective, and we also find changes by cell type when we then introduce inflammatory response. So the last thing I want to mention then in the area of RNA targeting therapies, such as ASOs, an accurate method has probably never been more important to know what you're actually targeting. And with that, I want to thank, uh, there's a lot of people I want to thank, but particularly Mina Wrighton, who's, who's the PI in the lab I work, and the, the rest of the group, but also the people at the Institute of Neurology here at IOM, collaborators from Lund University, Crick Institute, and Aztec Pharmaceuticals, for which have done the translation of work here. Yeah. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Emil, for that talk. Um, Liz, do you want to kick off the Q and A? Yeah. So um, I have a lot of questions since you covered a lot of ground. Um, and you've, you've told me this in the past, which is when you look at the even not like not just the GBA one gene, you were looking at other genes as well. Is it pervasive that you see the isoforms are donor specific? So you don't actually see a dominant isoform or, or that this actually is just for the GBA one gene? That actually depends on. Um, GBA is probably one of the more extreme cases, uh, yeah. but I, we tend to find that this is the case. Um, Actually, for a lot of the genes involved in lysosomal biology, for some reason, we see this. Whereas, for example, Sinuc and other PG genes, we see that they tend to be a more of a dominant transcript. So mm -hmm. it kind of varies. Yeah. OK. OK. So GB is an extreme. Because I remember in SNCA, when I did that targeted isoseq paper, um, it, the, the top isoforms were kind of like expected. But yeah. OK, so it's not the GBA one is, is specific. Um, I also was trying to understand when you talked about the GBAP1 has mass spec. So like, it seems like it was translated and ensure that both the pseudogene and the non-pseudogene are translated, but you said they don't have known enzymatic activity. So what is the potential rationale for what they're there for? Well, I, I think, for example, that GBA has a secondary function, uh, what it looks like in, in um, well, actually, I don't know where it is, but I, th I think this might be a secondary function because even for GBA, that means one third of potentially protein is not going to lysosome, which is for everyone studies GBA. Hmm. And I, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe the pseudogene has some overlapping function at whatever that is. Was it known that the pseudogene also gets translated? No. Okay. So this is a novel finding, which so you're able to see that because it was so similar to the, to the non-pseudogene, it wasn't easy to figure out what peptides could be specific to the pseudogene? Exactly. I think the only function that people have, uh, I guess, annotated to GBA uh, pseudogene is that it ha works as a microRNA sponge at the free from UTR, but uh, no, no translation. I haven't found that at least. Cool. Yeah. Um, I have some more questions, but Nina, I know there's some chat questions. Maybe we'll go to the, um, the attendees and then we'll come back to me. Um, great. So there was just um, a comment about machine learning, um, specifically LLM systems, enable full-length transcript identification from short reads in the near future. Um, and then there is a comment or a question, sorry, to what extent were the isoforms identified in the iPS-derived CNS cell types that were not observed in their human counterparts? Um, in general, we find uh fewer transcripts in the iPSC derived cell types than we do in the tissue. So I think it's probably that more of the ones we find in the tissue are not present in the iPSC, but for the genes that I looked at, we find all of the ones in the iPSC derived cell types in tissues, if that makes sense. Cool, can I ask my next question then? So the internal retention of APOE, um, 
I feel like I've heard the word internal tension enough today that I see a pattern. Do you think that's specific to neurodegenerative, uh, like genes associated with neurodegenerative diseases? Maybe, maybe not neurodegenerative, but maybe neurological. So uh, I have some preliminary, preliminary data showing that this is more prevalent in brain expressed genes. But that's also, we know that the uh, alternative splicing is more widespread in uh, brain expressed genes. So that might be part of that. And you also, at the title of that second part, you said low expression of yeah. a gene and you should apoe. So how lowly expressed is the, the like the intron 3 retention uh, of apoe? I represent about 1% uh, of total transcription. Okay. So it is, in apoe is one of those cases where there is a dominant transcript. So the most highly expressed transcript is about 97%. Oh, okay. Oh, so it would still have made it to like, I don't know, the top 10 isoform, except that it's like drastically lower than the Yeah, second. yeah, yeah. Okay, first, okay, that's cool. Um, maybe one last question, and I think you have you and I have chatted about this too, and I'll ask it in the open discussion as well. Right. It's like, for these genes that you're looking at, obviously they're from clinical, a lot of things are already from patient samples, and you have very like distinct genes you're going after. How do the findings from isoseq or even just the follow-ups is that going to lead? And you said it in your in your slides, like there's like ASOs and other things. How do you imagine like a path from research to, you know, a clinical outcome? I mean, the most obvious is, and that's something we're working on, is that when, you, when you're designing an ASO, do you actually know what transcripts are, are the uh, relevant ones for the disease you're looking at? And that you actually target those rather than the total gene expression, which is obviously not good for a lot of these genes that have vital functions regardless. So I think that's probably the most obvious case when you design ASOs actually know what you're targeting and if you can lower expression of specific transcripts rather than the gene itself. I think that's probably the most obvious. But other, other aspect is maybe finding novel gene function. I mean, mm -hmm. there was the science paper recently on the mitofuse in which everyone thought was only relevant for, for mitochondrial function, but they find a large proportion of transcription there is actually in the ER. So. I see. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think there might be other related questions, but let's go ahead and save those for the open discussion. Um, great, thank you, Emil. Um, so we are now on to our last session of this symposium, which is an open discussion with all of the speakers. So this is pretty general if you have any questions about um, pack bio or just long read RNA sequencing or something you heard in a specific talk, please go ahead and shoot them in the question session uh, section and we will get to them. Um, but for now, um, I think we will bring on all of the speakers, I believe. You may need to, yeah, turn on your cameras if you are a speaker. <laughs> I think Anise is here, but her camera isn't turned on yet. Oh, there you go. Okay. And then I think Mike is also on. Her yep. yep. First time. Um, but I don't see Mike's camera, even though it you says can... it's on. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Is, that, is it only because I'm only showing four of them? I do not see Mike either. Yeah, Mike, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Well, I'm here in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to try Mike turning, is... it off, turning it on again just to give it a yeah. shot? Yeah, did that. But let me turn this on. There it is. Oh, now I can see you. Awesome. Great. Cool. Awesome. Um, Nina, would you, do, do you think it would be useful to fish for, maybe finish some of the questions that um, we hadn't answered earlier? Um, sure. Yeah. And some of, I'll try to make them more generalizable. So we've got a few about, um, let's talk about ISOSeq. We have a few ISOSeq and MOS questions. Um, for isoseq, what depth of sequencing would you recommend for differential isoform usage? And I think there's been a few questions. Can you do quantification without short read data? So using only long reads. And 
a few of the speakers have kind of touched on this. I think it would, would it be okay you know, if we go around our speakers and ask them on their opinion since they've all done some amount of this? Please, yeah. Thoughts on isoseq, mosseq for a differential isoform expression? Uh, I'm happy to weigh in. I think um, the, the answer is unequivocally yes, you can do differential isoform expression without using short reads. Um, and um, we, I mean, we did this in the, in the developing human brain. We can e even recapitulate single cell clusters completely just using isoform only data, which I think also speaks to the, um, the, the, the biological information that's conveyed there. Um, and then I think, you know, d the, the depth question is, I think, somewhat of an, uh, of a moving target and something that also depends a ton on like, what your experimental design is and um, how much variation you expect to see in your data. I mean, are you looking at like a paired sample where it's the same sample from two different regions and it's very clean data, then like you might need you know, less sequencing than if you're looking at like a couple postmortem brain samples from cases versus controls or something like that. Um, and then also like whether or not you're potentially targeting very lowly expressed transcripts is the, is the mm -hmm. other question. Your thoughts, Emil? Um, interestingly, I think you tend to work on targeted uh, data. So it's, it, I'm curious, because for you, it's like the, the read death, if I understand, is plenty even without uh, concatenation on SQL2. Yeah. yeah, I mean, first of all, I echo what Michael said here. Uh, we, do, we do some untargeted as well. And I find that, yes, you can absolutely use this to quantify isoforms or gene expression, if you will. I would even argue for some of the genes we work on, it works much better than short read because as I showed you with, for example, with GBA, and when you have high sequence of um, similarity or homology, I would, I would argue that you can't quantify those with short read, but you do, you are able to do so with isoseq. And that's, that's what we found for not just GBA, GBA pseudogene, but other of these parent pseudogene pairs. So in some cases, I think it's definitely a, even a better approach mm -hmm. just for pure, pure gene, gene expression. Anise, any thoughts on this? Um, so in our experience, uh, we can quantify with long read uh, sequencing and do the differential um, isoform usage, but uh, maybe we can miss uh, the, uh, like uh, we, um, we can miss some isoforms due to the lower throughput. Mm. That makes sense. Um, maybe I'll also give my current thoughts on this. I think realistically, before, when we were talking about whole transcriptome, I think in the SQL two days, it was it was truly difficult to get enough reads, right? And also, um, you know, at a at a cost efficient manner. Like the answer is, you can always get enough reads if you sequence a lot, but that's not always feasible for uh, for customers. And I want to point out, I know Jack is not um, attending live today, but if you looked at it, he he ran thirty. 30 samples on the microglia with 89 million reads, right? And that I believe took 20 to 22. So he might come back and tell me I got the numbers wrong, but I think he did 20 to 22 SQL2 smart cells, right? So if we do that at the end of this year with MOSFOC and Reveal, that's two smart cells. And that's a tenfold difference of not just the amount of cost it takes, labor, but also sequencing time, you know, instead of sequencing it in 22 days, you have you can sequence it now in a single day, right? With four smart cells on a on a Revio run. I think that the the amount of labor, like I feel like sequencing is no longer the bottleneck. I actually think the analysis is going to be. So I'll talk about that. Oh, that'll be something I'll ask later. Yeah. Cool. Nina, do you want a, another question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few questions um, about, I guess the MOS workflow. So what's PacBio doing to reduce the amount of input material needed? And then for those who've used single cell MOS, do you see a um, difference in RIN scores, seven versus eight or nine, um, when you look at total number of reads and depth of coverage? 
Uh, let me think. Maybe I'll answer the Moss question on the on the what the question from Moss was. Remind me again the first part of the question. Um, input material needed. Input material needed. Um, if it's from a single cell, it's 50 nanograms of cDNA from 10x. My understanding, and I'll ask Mionis and, and Mike, is I haven't seen it being an issue, maybe except for some. I know some um, cell types are more difficult with the chromium, but I haven't seen it being at least a constant issue. Um, I know, Anissa, you've run some 10x, and Mike, you have as well. Do you guys see this be an issue? OK. OK, so it's, it's no. Um, as for RIN, I'll also ask you guys, since you have all done bulk as well, um, I have not seen a drastic difference between seven, eight, or nine. I have seen a drastic difference between three and seven. Same, same with you guys. The short, the short answer is for us, we, we haven't looked because it's been uh, expensive enough, uh, you know, that we didn't want to use tissue that was under seven but um so we we haven't seen a difference like you said i think all, all of our scores are over seven and they've like the length distributions have been good and we haven't like seen any drops in like gene body coverage across the five prime to three prime end which is the other way that we sort of evaluate like rna degradation um and it, it's looked fine in our hands yeah i said enough have tried it out <laughs> and yes uh, I, I agree. Over seven, I think it doesn't make much difference, but below it definitely makes a big difference. And I guess we spend a lot of time in, I guess, in defining what we call a transcript, and that becomes very challenging when you have poor, poor in, poor in values, right? Because you get a lot of high prime degradation and so on. So that's been a massive challenge for us when we work with, because we work with a lot of uh, human pet tissue, which might not always be the best, best RNA quality. That's probably a consideration. The input I'm not so concerned with the, the, in terms of the, uh, well, the the RNA needed. Great. Um, this question maybe is a ICC content question. Um, is there any bias to detect high GC content isoforms, and how does ISOC do in repetitive regions in general? I guess. I think I'll also give my general view, but you guys look at very specific genes and you might know different. Um, I haven't seen a strong GC bias. Um, I'll say that recently there's actually a preprint out using uh, ISO single cell isoseq on plasmodium, which is I think 80 over 80% 80 AT rich, and we did not have any issues sequencing it. Um, PacBio is you know based on HiFi sequencing, so we certainly can sequence. Um, very extreme and GC content. I do think the difficulty might come from uh, synthesizing the cDNA, but it sounds like you know based on based on what we've seen in the plasmodium, it seems like not to be a big issue. I think the hard issue was like, what do you do with all the A's? Um, any uh, any thoughts on what you guys have looked at for your extreme any any extreme GC contents you've been looking at? We, we haven't seen any um, or, or noticed any anything um, out of the ordinary. Um, and I think this is also going to apply more to the, like, like you said, the library prep stage, like your P PCR amplification is really going to be the main issue of like how much PCR do you need to do? Um, in, and, and that might like, you know, drive differences in GC contents, I would imagine. Okay. Um, and then there's... actually the question about repetitive regions that, that um, this is also actually interesting. Um, so I think Emil kind of mentioned something like this too. And I, we also see something in our hands where like, uh, because the reads are longer, they're, they're actually mapping much more confidently to the human genome. So we get much higher, much not like, you know, a, a fair bit higher um, alignments using Minimap 2 of our reads, which um, I think allows us to be more um, precise when we're quantifying genes that are do have you know, repetitive uh, regions or that like might get thrown out because they were previously considered like multi-mapped short reads and, and things like that, so. 
Yeah, for and like Emil, when I saw your GBA versus GBA P1, the the first thought I had was, you know, um, the ICLO lab, which specializes in looking at, you know, human segmental duplications, has actually years ago already used targeted ISOseq to look at. I think those were even more extreme. It was ninety over ninety nine percent similar. They're not repetitive per se, but um, but it just says that like when you have full length and high quality, you're really able to see the difference between between those genes. And I think repetitive, interesting, I think the answer will become whether the annotation is correct and whether the genome is correct. Yeah, actually I comment on that. I think it's not just in, in terms of homopolymers, but it could also be even you have a functional domain repeated within a gene. So you might have the same stretch, doesn't have to be a, a, a repetitive in terms of GCC or so. That's another place where I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, updates in annotation for those type of genes. Might be transplant brain regions or so on. Okay, um, another broad question for all of you. What do you think is the best strategy for orthogonal validation of new isoforms? What are what are you using? What what do you recommend checking out? I think I'll leave the speakers to speak first since generally they are have a vested interest in uh, validating their isoforms and maybe I'll chime in at the end. Yeah, I guess we spend quite a lot of time on, on that question, actually. Um, we, 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 we try to use a lot of different resources. One is using uh, things like uh, KCHIC data for five prime ends. We use Polay Atlas. We use uh, short read for individual, individual splicing events. And uh, what we spend a lot of time on right now is actually integrating uh, mass spec and particularly top-down mass spec to see if we can actually validate no, novel open reading frames as well. So actually on that note, we, we have a software that's going to be able to do exactly that shortly. But yeah, so we, we try to use different types of resources to actually validate different segments of the gene if we load a transcript. Any thoughts on this, Mike and Anise? Mike, you actually did some validation in in the recent work. Yeah, I mean, I think our, I think our approach is similar, and I think kind of in general, the approaches that I've seen in the published literature all kind of follow the, this Quanti pipeline, which looks um, or to uh, find orthogonal support at the five prime end, orthogonal support at the three prime end, and then um, whether or not the intron chains basically or the splice junctions are, are detected. And you can use different types of genomic data, whether it's cage seq data for the five prime end or attack seq, we've also used um, to, to validate the sort of promoter regions. Um, the three prime, you know, poly A uh, database or poly A predictions. Um, and then Intropolis we've used as this short read junction database um, that's helpful. And then we've also looked at and validated using like mass spec based proteomics as, as Emil mentioned. So we're finding some of the, the novel you know, peptide spectrum that support uh, some of our open reading frames. Um, I think also there was a question a while ago, somebody in the audience or the audience had mentioned this uh, large language model issue. Like, I think that this also is actually gonna solve some of these problems of like knowing really what the true like ends of the gene at beginning and ends of the genes are like based on sequence level predictions. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of an interesting space to look. And um, we can do the qualification with PCR and also RNA situ uh, hybridization. Uh, if we can design like um, a unique uh, probes for the novel isoforms that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so maybe my comment on this was just um, I was reading the LR gas preprint, which I had a slide on. I think one of the most shocking, shocking things from that paper was when they did some of the RT-PCR validation of novel isoforms. I think what they found was like, okay, it's not surprising if all of the software pipelines, because they did a whole bunch, they did ONT, direct RNA, cDNA, they did PacBio, they did it with and without five from capture. They did, um, they did like, 
five or t six different software. And they said, if everything, everybody predicts them, and that means it's like basically unanimous vote that this thing really exists, and then they go validate that novel isoform, they find it. That's not surprising. I think what they said was surprising was like, if I have an isoform that one or two pipeline predicts, and it only shows up in packed bio, usually your common sense would say it's an artifact. And they went and validated, they're like, actually, it's really there? Like it really was transcribed. And so I think what they're trying to say is like these isoforms are probably real. They do get transcribed, whether they get translated or they have a function is a different thing. And I think, Emil, if you looked at your GBA, one example, like if people say, hey, you don't see a dominant isoform, therefore nothing is real, <laughs> that would have been that would have been a, a very incorrect conclusion, right? So I think um, it's not so much about orthogonal validation that I'm talking about. I'm just like people have historically been very suspicious of donor specific or rare isoforms thinking that they must not be real if i only see them with one pipeline or i only see them with one one platform and i think that paper has done a lot of jobs to say like no actually sometimes they are real whether they're useful <laughs> i think is a completely different story and that's one of the things that the consortium is kind of coming out was like well these are definitely real but what are we going to do with them Liz, could you drop the LR gas in the chat? Oh, yes, I will. Okay. I know there's more questions coming, so I'll, I'll go and do that while um, people ask questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Trying to organize them so they're similar. Um, maybe we could switch gears a little bit and talk about tools. I think there are some questions around um, just general resources to get started with analyzing this sort of data. Um, folks who are um, some someone some that are friendly to people with little computer science background. Um, what are the common tools? Are they free to use, etc.? Especially um, for long read sequencing, I guess. Um, okay, so I, I come to, I was typing the uh, gas preprint. So maybe I'll talk about like, at least what I, what PacBio is now supporting and will be supporting with uh, the new release with the mass bulk and single cell kit is for bulk, we are going to support till the end of Sconti, we call it pigeon. So we're going to give you isoform classification and recounts. I, I think things like joint sample analysis, anything like differential expression, um, open read prediction right now is what I call tertiary analysis tools. So um, I think the person was asking like, how is a non-computer scientist, how easy would it be for me to make sense of the data? Um, I think for single, uh, maybe I'll jump around. Single cell I think is a little easier because I think most things are now in GUIs, right? If I get it right, if you do smart link single cell and then you import the result into Kana, which is all GUI based, I think you can get most of the things done. Um, Surat isn't GUI based, but I think there's enough tutorials around seems doable. Um, bulk, I think, Mike, you've done that DSeq and I think DXseq, it looks like they're all command line. I, I'm, I still need to think about what there are. And Emil, you're doing developing your own pipeline too. So, and Anise, you guys did your own things too. So maybe I'll just ask all of you, like, what are you doing now? Um, what are you developing? And what, for, if, if someone comes to you and say, hey, I want to do the kind of work you're doing, how easy would, would it be for them if they're not, you know, computer savvy? I, I can start. Well, to, to get to uh, uh, an output with your GDF, so basically get your uh, transcripts per gene and a read count matrix, I would say it's quite straightforward now. I mean, you have the ISOSeq workflow that does that. Um, we, I mean, we have a snake makes this and others have it too, to use different tools to get to that stage. I think what takes a bit more time, but maybe it's a little bit different is the interpretation of the output. I find, I find that, and that's where we spent a lot of time building tools for visualization and as you said, orthog orthogonal uh, validation of transcripts. That is a bit more finicky. I don't know if you necessarily need that much computer science experience. It's just probably more important to have a biological experience at that time or, or input. But uh, the other thing I think is for single samples, but if you want to start comparing multiple samples, I think, I, I guess maybe Mike, Mike has more experience in that. I think that that's a slightly different thing because what we find is that if you use a, a, a annotation, so a gen code and ensemble annotation, 
you might you might lose a lot of uh, novel transcripts and those might not be caused the same across samples so that that needs a little bit more thinking that's why i find that you might want to use a, uh, your own reference to align to but in in general to get to an output ddf and read count matrix i think it's quite straightforward for most people now Yeah, so I'll just follow, follow up on, on that. Um, I think that the downstream analysis, once you have is uh, a matrix of isoforms and counts per sample, I think that's relatively straightforward. Um, even if you're not super computer savvy, I think like some of the bioconductor workflows are actually pretty straightforward to follow, like for, for DEC2, for example, um, that, that works pretty much out of the box, like for the ISIS, uh, ISIS data. Um, and actually this isoform switch analyzer package that we also use has the ability directly to import data from some of the long read sequencing pipelines. And so, and has a lot of these tools sort of running under the hood. Um, but I, I agree that there's, um, in the, 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 the critical question is, that I think is still not fully re resolved um, in the field is kind of how you quantify, how, how you get that matrix of isoform, isoforms and counts and, what, what tool do you use or how do you call the isoforms that are novel or not novel? And um, I think I think there's some benchmarking still being done. And I think that the, the recent LR gas paper had some recommendations about different pipelines that seem to sort of be consistent across multiple methods. But you know, we found very, very different results uh, depending on you know different pipelines and tools that we've used. And so I think it's um, it still is uh, a moving target, I think, a little bit in terms of um, how to how to best do this. Mm, our lab is also using a lot of PacBio tools like Squanty and ISO 63, but also we are um, modifying and uh, developing our own for joint sample analysis and visualization. Oh, yeah, so I think what the emerging picture is that, you know, at PacBio, we're kind of providing the baseline for, you know, isoform level classification and, and counts. I think what I do here is continues to be hard is visualization, joint sample analysis, and making sense of the novel isoforms, or even call it, calling them consistently across samples. That's something we definitely know. I do want to also kind of, you know, one of the um, attendees asked, like, you know, very specific question, but I can answer generic, like, for example, Bamboo is another common software tool. Um, how do you prevent overfitting from training on the same data? Well, I don't know the specific answer to that. I could say LR gas paper actually did look into, you know, what are the, what happens to these tools when you change the assumption, right? Bamboo requires training data um, and, they actually tested this on human mouse and manatee, which doesn't have an annotation. And it's interesting, you could see the results completely change when you go from like a human mouse centric system where you know very well the isoforms and you can train on them to manatee where you basically have no knowledge of what's going on. Some of the best performing software actually flip in these. So uh, I would say if you can take a look at the Arlogast paper, which is actually in the, pre in the, in the chat, um, it's it's a long paper, but I'll just say if you quickly kind of search for the different section, it actually does have really good recommendations throughout. Yeah, and I think Great. I don't know if you agree. It also depends on the question you're trying to answer with the with the long with ISOC. If this is to quantify annotated transcripts, if it is to find novel transcripts, or if it's just to improve a gene expression analysis. I think different tools probably perform different for those different tasks. Great. Um, so there's a few questions that have kind of asked about the topic of whether or not short read sequencing is needed. Um, there's a specific one at single cell. Do you think it's necessary to generate short read data in parallel to validate cell type identification? Um, so I think maybe we'll make that more broad in general. Do you think long read is sufficient? Is there a use case for short read? 
um, in your opinion? And if so, where, where have you used it? I can start on this one. I, I think uh, specifically on the single cell question, um, you know, I, I think when the these pipelines and approaches were just getting started, it wasn't clear that you would have enough sequencing depth um, from the long read sequencing to to really identify the, the cell clusters and identities. Um, and our our data, I think, definitely shows that the isoform quantification, the long read sequencing data, is totally sufficient for calling. Uh, major cell clusters in uh, with, without the need for matching barcodes to short read sequencing. That being said, it still depends on how many cells we're talking about. If you're you know going to sequence a million cells, then maybe it's a different matter. But um, if you're doing sort of standard, you know, 10x lanes and things like that, like um, we, we, I don't think you need short read data anymore. And I'll definitely see the use of short read data still. Uh, if, I'm, if I would focus on, on, for example, novel transcript discovery, because it, it's still, it's still the depth you get with short read is, is still higher and it's uh, obviously cheaper, so you can scale it up. And you, you might then focus on spe specific splicing events and so on. So the, it works in terms of validation, but also uh, to, to quantify this across a broader number of samples. And I think that's how we mainly use it now. But yes, definitely has a function still. Also, we are planning to um, test on whether we need uh, to short read um, for a tissue that is heterogeneous and has a lot of cells like brain. So definitely mass MASIC improved a lot on this. So it like gives us an idea that it can possibly um, uh, um, improve that we don't need the short read, but we are planning to test on this more. Okay, um, let's see, going through these. Um, maybe a question for Mike or anyone who knows about it. Are there any consortium type efforts to develop isoform level maps of expression across human tissues or cell types? Uh, that, yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, I think ENCODE is definitely doing some of this work, I know, um, and has already released actually some long read sequencing data across different cell types and, and or cell lines. Um, I believe the developmental GTEx project actually includes a long read sequencing component as well, um, uh, and will be doing some tissue level quantifications. And, um, in and I think the GTEx one of the GTEx papers actually already has quantified uh, in some tissues the uh, long read sequencing. Um, but I'm not aware of any other, the, the, those are the main ones I'm aware of at the, at the moment. Yeah, I think more will come. I, get, I think again that, you know, GTEx, I think a few years ago, um, some folks had done them with um, ONT data. I actually recall reading the paper. I think as the cost and the efficiency for long range sequencing goes down i can i i do actually see that that coming forward and maybe this is the time for me to ask a question to you guys is that what are your thoughts on how we're going to annotate and store and share these isoforms right because you found new isoforms and you found new isoforms and where are people going to share them <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a good question. I mean, that's why you have um, hopefully a consortia like uh, uh, Ensemble or Gencode can help with this, right? To build build novel annotations to this, because it's obviously going to be a lot of, like LR gas has shown. There's going to be differences depending on what tool, how we analyze, what sample you sequence. So this always need to be done in a, a I guess a rigorous manner to have it. But right now, it's a lot of people just. Like, like ourselves sharing it on, on, on gene expression omnibus and so on as GTFs or raw data. But yet to actually put this together to a, a proper map, that would probably take a, a, a consortium to do this properly, I would assume. 
That's a really good point. And I think the other point is like, you know, the more that we sequence, the more that we find, I, I feel like. And um, th this has definitely been our experience. So like including additional donors or additional developmental time points or tissues. And so in many cases, and, and then in many cases, the way that we're calling isoforms, um, at least if you use like say the talent pipeline, um, for example, it, it, you need to observe it a, a minimum of a certain number of times across a certain number of unique donors. And so as, as more data is collected, I think these annotations are gonna like then have to be updated um, sort of iteratively as well. So I, I agree like some kind of consortium level effort. And, uh, but, but what we're doing is exactly what Emil just said too, which is just kind of downloading data from Geo or from Synapse or from DB Gap or, or wherever we can get access to it and um, try to do it in house. Yeah, I mean, so my my background is actually as a geneticist, and then wherever you find a new variant, right, you you kind of report that to NCBI, get the SS and the RSID, and I think something similar probably is going to have have to happen here, but then it gets validated across different uh, experiments or different different groups. I'm assuming that's probably how this is going to have have to have to be done. Liz, you probably got time for maybe one more question or so. Uh, I think the last one, because I um, I do think we do want to end on time. Maybe the last question is open ended. You know, Emil, Ani, and Mike with Mass Bulk and also now Mass Single Cell, how do you see that changes your research scope? Does it or does it not? Yeah, well, yeah. it does for me. For 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 the sorry for the single cell work, uh, you can scale it up now. So that's that's definitely that's definitely where I see uh, we're changing what what we're doing is just to uh, single cell mass. Yeah. Yeah, we are in the like beginning of this massic project that we started, and we are excited to see what will uh, go next. So. Yeah, we definitely think that it can help us. So I, I, I'm also a geneticist, and so I'm really interested in sort of population level variation and trying to link DNA variants to molecular mechanisms like uh, di you know differences in transcript uh, abundance or expression. And so I think that you know being able to build large scale population level atlases at the isoform level, I think ultimately it's gonna be um, really critical. And I think, you know, being able to do this at, at, at scale. Um, and so that's what, what I'm pretty excited about uh, in the, the next couple of years. Cool. Fantastic. All right, so. With that, we are at time. I want to thank all of our speakers for um, joining us, all of you for listening in. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with a few things, and speakers, feel free to log off if you want. Um, so first, in the next week or so, we're going to be sending an email with a link to today's symposium um, recording. So you should be able to go back and listen to any part of it again if you would like to. Um, second, please keep up to date on any upcoming PacBio webinars and events um, by visiting pacb.com slash events. We list everything out there. And then finally, immediately following this webinar, you'll receive a short questionnaire. Um, please do take just a couple of minutes to um, fill it out. It really helps us to understand your needs and plan for future webinars. And we might follow up on a few things, like for those of you interested in testing out Keepin's tool, we can include um, a chance to follow up in there. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, hope you join us again for a future webinar. Um, with that, take care.